May I have your attention, please? As there is no quorum requirement for the annual Springtown meeting and the town clerk is present to make record of the proceedings, the chair calls to order the first adjourned session of the 2018 Springtown meeting. This meeting is being broadcast live on the Groton Channel. It is also being videotaped for rebroadcast and posting on the internet. In addition, it is being audio taped for record keeping purposes. Please take this time to silence your electronic devices. Voters may sit in any available seat except the last two rows. Those rows are reserved for guests and non-voters who are asked to remain quiet during the proceedings and silent during voting. Voters who wish to address the meeting should proceed to the nearest microphone and wait to be called on by the chair. While it is not a legal requirement, you may, if you wish, provide your name and address. At our opening session on April 30th, the meeting voted to limit speakers to three minutes except for those who are primary proponents or primary opponents. These presenters are limited to seven minutes per the ruling of the chair. Mr. Catalo is our timekeeper. He will raise the yellow flag at a one minute warning and the red flag asking you to wrap up your remarks. A wireless microphone is available for anyone who wishes to use it. Honor Society student Vicki Belanger, I believe, is here yes, with the wireless microphone. She's seated uh, in the middle of the auditorium. Please get her, her attention or the chairs by waving your green voter card, which you should have received when you came in. Do not lose this voter card. If we need to vote by a show of hands or by counting, only those with a card will be counted. Be sure you have your informational packet and other materials from the table in the hallway. This contains the main motions to be made tonight and is an important reference tool. The town clerk wishes to remind all voters that the town election is scheduled for Tuesday, May 22nd. Absentee ballots are now available from the town clerk's office. On May 22nd, polls will be open from 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Voters should vote at their assigned polling location which is either the senior center or the country club. Pages two and three in the warrant contain the elected town offices and questions on the ballot. The ballot includes the debt exclusion question that must pass for the new senior center to be constructed and eight non-binding questions regarding aspects of recreational marijuana. As for your information, a candidates forum is planned for May 15th. At 7.30 p.m. at the Groton Senior Center, it is sponsored by the Groton Democratic Town Committee. It will be recorded and broadcast on local access channel. Last week, the meeting complete art completed Articles 1 to 15. The chair expects to complete business tonight on the rest of the Warren Articles. That includes 16 to 31, as well as the consent agenda with Articles 32 to 42. When we get to, article, to the consent agenda, we will vote on it as one item with no debate unless a voter wishes to remove an article from the consent agenda for individual consideration. Article 16 is the CPA funding accounts, Mr. Bruce Isom. Mr. Moderator. I move that the town vote to appropriate and allocate the following sums from the Community Preservation Fund to the following sub-accounts. CPC operating expenses, $5,000. Open space reserve, $73,800. Historic resource reserve, $73,800. Community housing reserve, $73,800. And unallocated reserve, $511,600. Article 16 has been moved and seconded, Mr. Eason. Article 16 is an annual exercise to place the next year's fiscal, next fiscal year's anticipated Community Preservation Act fund revenues into bins. They are the community housing, historic, open space and recreation and unallocated reserve. 
And it is on out, out of these uh, funding bins that the uh, town meeting will approve uh, projects. Except for the $5,000 for the Community Preservation Committee's operating expenses, all fund expenditures will require an additional vote by town meeting. Those requests will come in Article 17. I have a slide that shows the uh, financial snapshot of the community preservation uh, bin balances. This is also on page 45 in your packet. In the first slide, you show a projection of the revenue uh, that we expect uh, to be able to fund Community Preservation Act projects for fiscal year 2019. They consist of a bin balance that we anticipate when we close out the books on FY 2018. Uh, we have anticipated revenues from the local surcharge. There is a 3% surtax on your real estate tax bill, those funds go into the Community Preservation Act uh, bins. There's also a state match where, for conservative fiscal purposes, we're projecting to be about 10% of the local surcharge and then some additional interest. Uh, so when you add those up, you can see that um, in the Community Housing Reserve, we have about half a million dollars of revenue uh, available. In the historic reserve, we have about $150,000. In the open space and recreation, just shy of 100,000. And then in the unallocated reserve, we have over $750,000. From those, we will uh, subtract $5,000, assuming you approve this article for the CPC administration, and then $60,000 of open space and recreation to fund the surrendered farm debt service and the balance of the surrendered farm debt service for FY19 out of the unallocated reserve. And so uh, with those basically committed amounts, the uh, available funds for the articles that you'll be discussing in Article 17 are shown in the bottom row. In the next slide, we're showing you what happens to those fund balances should you approve the funds. Um, that are in article, the, approve the projects that are in Article 17. There's a change from what's in uh, your handout due to some last minute changes. First change is the housing coordinator request for funds has jumped to 50,668. Uh, and the old meeting house has been withdrawn. Uh, but if you fund all of the projects at the amounts requested uh, the bin balances at the end of SY19 will be what you see in the bottom rows. I want to point out that um, the Community Preservation Act funds are completely discretionary except for the payment of the surrender and farm debt service. Uh, approving expenditures will not raise your taxes. Choosing not to fund projects will not lower them. There is, however, an opportunity cost associated with funding current projects if some unforeseen wonderful but expensive and eligible project comes forward in future years, then those funds will simply not be available. I'd also like to say that uh, the Community Preservation Committee is, uh, is, is down a member. Uh, uh, Mr. Michael Roberts, a longtime CPA advocate, um, died earlier this year. Uh, and um, although nobody can replace him, I would urge anybody who's interested in working with the Community Preservation Committee to fund historic open space, recreation, and community housing projects to come and see me after the meeting, and we'll get you signed up with a community interest form. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments under Article 16? Floor is now open for debate. If there is any, I may not be able to see them. If we could have the house lights back up, please. Yes, in the back. Yes, Connie Sartini. If, Bruce, if I read this correctly, the balance after, if we approve all of these, would be $5,451. Is that correct? 
page 45. If you're looking at page 45 on the second page, that's, that is, uh, has, has been superseded by what you see on the screen here tonight. Oh, okay. What was the balance last year? Uh, we expect to close out uh, FY 2018, which is the current fiscal year, with about 442,000. Those numbers are actually on slide one mm -hmm. and are correct on page 45 of your packet. Okay. 40, 40, 442,000 in community housing reserve, 76,148 in historic, 23,587, and 252,384 in unallocated reserve. It's been the practice of the Community Preservation Act to uh, allocate only the minimum as required by Mass General Law, Chapter 44B, to the community housing, historic, and open space and recreation bins and leave the maximum amount in unallocated reserve. And that allows the Community Preservation to, Committee to recommend to town meeting uh, the best project, no matter which category under, under which it falls. So that's continued uh, for the FY19 budget pri um, priority as well. Further comments or questions under Article 16? It requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? <laughs> Article 16 passes by a unanimous vote. We'll now move to Article 16. We'll deal with five main motions. The first is motion one, affordable housing coordinator. The mover is Daniel Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town vote pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, chapter 44B, section five, to appropriate the sum of $50,688 from the Community Preservation Fund Community Housing Reserve to fund Community Preservation Application 2019-1, Affordable Housing Coordinator. Motion one has been moved and seconded. Mr. Emerson? Yes, the summary, the town established the position of the housing coordinator in 2009. Since that time, the Community Preservation Administrative Account has paid for the salary of this position. Four years ago, the Community Preservation Committee approved the increase of the position to 25 hours and requested that it become an annual funding item to be approved at town meeting with the funding to come from the community housing reserve. The town meeting has approved this for the last four years. This will be the fifth year that this position will be funded in this, this manner. If there are any questions, Mark Haddad is the sponsor or proponent of this article. Thank you. Any questions or comments on Article 17, Motion 1? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion one passes by unanimous vote. Ladies and gentlemen, the warrant in the packet contained article and, an article and a motion regarding the old meeting house project. Since the warrant was posted, the Community Preservation Committee has voted to rescind its prior recommendation for funding the old meeting house preservation phase two. In the absence of that recommendation, motion two cannot move forward at this town meeting. Section five of chapter 44B of the Community Preservation Act says town meeting may only appropriate community preservation funds if it has a recommendation from the Community Preservation Committee. In the absence of that recommendation, we cannot take any action tonight. With that, we will proceed to motion three, Ms. Perkins. I move that the town vote pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 44B, Section 5, to appropriate the sum of $130,000 from the Community Preservation Fund Historic, Reserve, Historic Resource Reserve and to appropriate the sum of $145,330 from the Community Preservation Fund Unallocated Reserve for a total of $275,330 to fund the Community Preservation Application 2019-03, 
Prescott School upgrades. I believe the proponents are going Motion to. Motion three has been oh, moved sorry. and seconded. <laughs> Ms. Perkins. Uh, this is, uh, and I believe that someone's going to speak to this, but this is to pay for uh, sprinklers <laughs> and an automatic door opener. With a presentation, Mr. Halsey Platt of the Friends of Prescott. So we've got four slides. Um, I'll run through them uh, very quickly. Um, next one. So uh, for the last two years, the town meeting has voted to support uh, Prescott School with other upgrades. Um, these are some photographs, probably a little hard to see, uh, of the upgrades that have been happening. Uh, Mark Haddad has been managing the process and that's been moving along. I've gotten a number uh, of um, very positive improvements done. Uh, so the left-hand photo uh, is a snapshot of the uh, enclosure for the two staircases. So uh, the, there's a front staircase and a back staircase to Prescott. They are now both uh, completely enclosed, creating a place of refuge uh, in the event that there was ever a fire. Uh, in the building that somebody can go into the stairway uh, and exit, and if uh, they were unable to get out, that there's, uh, that there's now one hour fire separation. So that's now been done. Um, the upper right-hand photo um, is the photograph of the two uh, egress stairs that were rebuilt for, off of the back of the gymnasium, uh, and so those are now uh, up to code. Uh, part of the issue there was about raising the platform up uh, so that if somebody was in the gymnasium uh, and unable to step down uh, to the outside platform and go down the stairs, uh, they can now be wheeled uh, right out. Uh, and then the lower uh, right hand, the uh, handicapped spaces got re-signed uh, and uh, repainted in the pavement. This year's request uh, is to do two things. One, uh, put in a sprinkler system. So uh, two years ago, uh, we had gone out to bid for a sprinkler system. We got back one bid of $182,000. We took uh, to, to arrive at this um, estimated cost. Um, we took that bid, increased it uh, by 10%, um, and then included the cost uh, to excavate for a new water service line. Uh, and then um, there's a fee to the uh, town water department to pay for the new uh, six inch line to come into the building to be able to sprinkler the building. Uh, so that's what makes up the uh, largest portion of the costs. Uh, the lower half um, is then putting an automatic door, so a door actuator and button um, on the right hand uh, side entrance so that if somebody came up the handicapped stairs, um, they could then automatically open the door. Um, so that's uh, the total cost. Um, the uh, fire chief um, has written a letter in support uh, of this article, um, really citing two things. One, that uh, historic buildings, their, their biggest threat to their survival is fire. Uh, you know, and we all know that the Groton Inn, uh, you know, was lost to a fire back in 2011. Uh, and the second thing is uh, safety to both the occupants and the firefighters. In the event that there was ever an issue, um, the having sprinklers in there dramatically uh, increases the safety of anybody that's in there for occupation, occupants or uh, anybody coming in to fight the fire. Happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions or comments from the floor? Yes, ma'am. Michelle Collette, ADA coordinator. I would like to express appreciation on behalf of the Commission on Accessibility for the town of Groton and the Friends of Prescott uh, addressing the issues that were identified last fall. And we're particularly grateful for uh, the funds to remedy the back door, which is very difficult to open at the present time. And it is the door uh, at the existing ramp uh, on the side, on the right-hand side of the building. So thank you for addressing those issues. Other comments and debate? Yes. The Sustainability Commission voted unanimously to support this article. Anyone else? Mr. Prest?
I might press. Um, on this item, I'm speaking as a resident of Groton, not as a member of the Finance Committee. In recent meetings of the Selectmen and the Finance Committee, I've expressed caution in approval of this expenditure of $275,300 for a sprinkler system in the door and other things. I don't want the Prescott School to become another town asset, quote unquote, like the Groton Country Club that up until recently required large subsidies of taxpayer money year after year. For those who have not been following the recent discussions on the future use and renegotiation, renovation of the Prescott School, here's some background. The Prescott School is in dire need of major renovations in order for the Prescott School to meet state building codes that would be would allow both community and commercial use without rental revenue from commercial businesses and, and with the Groton Dunstable Regional School District administration moving out this coming August, the actual cost of maintaining and operating the building will likely require significant taxpayer subsidies. In addition, the 2016 uh, Municipal Building uh, Committee for Prescott School estimated that the renovation costs will eventually range between 4.2 and $5.8 million. As, as of today, we do not have a sufficient detail as what said renovations might actually entail and what the cost might be for those renovations that will be required to allow mixed use of the, for community and commercial uh, licensees that would defray future costs to the taxpayers of Groton. It must be noted that according to the 2016 Municipal Building Committee for the Prescott School, the report said that over the past 20 years, the town has already spent $683,000 in taxpayer money in upgrades to the Prescott School for such items as a new roof, new windows, new heating system, a fire alarm system, etc. But when the town attempted to sell the building in 2015, the highest bid that was received was $35,000. Thus, the past renovations apparently did not add value to the building, and I doubt that the expenditure of another $275,000 would value, add value as well. If the town meeting approves this item this evening, I recommend that the expenditure of this money be contingent on the outcome of a completed engineering study of the cost of the renovation required to bring the building up to state building codes that would allow mixed use by the community as well as commercial businesses. If such renovation costs are prohibitive, then the town manager should not expend said sums unless a fi financially viable plan for future use of the building is established. I would also recommend that any more operating money is granted for the operation of the building, that a five-year business plan that doesn't require taxpayer money be approved by the select board of Groton. And lastly, it must be noted that the town meeting never voted to retain the Prescott as a town asset. The, as the local newspaper claimed last week, the town meeting only voted not to sell the Prescott School to a town resident for $35,000 if it never voted to retain Mr. the Press, school Trapp. as a town asset. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Platt, did you want to respond? Or Mr. Petropoulos? Thank you. So uh, with regard to subsidizing the Prescott School, we are going to spend money on the Prescott School for as long as we own it. <clears throat> we have to at least keep it uh, heated, et cetera. Those costs are something like $15,000 a year. If it's completely occupied and heated for occupancy, it might cost up to $30,000 a year. The plan is to have an entity in there that will be generating revenue and contributing to that $30,000 a year, quite possibly taking the cost down below 15 and maybe even to zero. We don't know, but this within the last year, the Friends of Prescott has run such an operation there, and in two cycles of classes has gone from over 100 attendees in, one, in the first cycle to over 200 attendees in the second cycle, and is on a trajectory of growth for income as well as use of that building that is tremendous benefit to our community. The Prescott use, its future use, will require that we change the use of the building from educational to business. Uh, not many months ago, Mr. Platt and I contacted a state building inspector who told us that this very article, the funding for this very article, the installation of sprinklers, 
would be a tremendous asset in assuring that that change of use could be granted. Today, we met with two different building inspectors who, when we talked about the fact that sprinklers would be installed, similarly indicated that this uh, installation of sprinklers would be a tremendous asset in granting a change of use. <clears throat> the, we've spoken with a commercial developer who told us that the, the investment of this money in the sprinkler system would be returned to us in, somewhere in the order of 75 to 90 percent when we go to sell this building. So all in all, this is an investment for which the financial we will see a financial return of at least 70%. It's helping us to advance the cause of keeping this building as a community center. And this community center has demonstrated its value to our community. I urge you to allow us to go forward with this. No one is saying that we have to keep this building. We are saying that we want to, be demonst we want to demonstrate the opportunity to keep this building without it being a burden on the town. The friends of Prescott or whoever will occupy this building will have to come forward with a business plan that will show the economic viability of that operation. Thank you. Mr. Platt. Um, I, I would also just like to share, so I, I've been a resident of the town about 30 years now, and my perspective, uh, I've been working with the friends of Prescott and I'm very eager to see uh, the Friends of Prescott succeed there, but more importantly than that, from my perspective, this is the largest building that we, as the town of Groton, own in the center of town. Right? Uh, I suspect that in the reasonably near future, 10 years, uh, we will be outstripping the square footage of town hall and need additional square footage, or have already have one town office over there. I mean, my perspective is the town of Groton has been around for 350 years, Yes, uh, all of the investment that Mr. Prest listed uh, has happened, and I think it's been a wise investment, just as we maintain any building. So I would urge town meeting to go ahead and do this to be able to preserve Prescott, uh, certainly for uh, the immediate uh, potential of the friends of Prescott, but more importantly for the long-term uh, use of the town. Is there other debate? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Hi, Marlena Gilbert, 45 Arbor Way. So I just want to voice my concerns, and, and I, many of them echo uh, Mr. Art Prest. I see some very large investments coming down the pike for our town. I see a very large tax bill already, so I'm very selective in regards to what I have to pay and for those needs and what would be nice to have. And we already have a community center for our students, which is called the Peter Toomey Center, where there are adult programs being run there. We are in the midst of already approved a project for the center, which will accommodate our seniors in the same exact way we accommodate our youth over at the Peter Toomey Center. In, in addition, that will serve as a mixed use usage at time as well. So right now, we have a Peter Toomey Center, and we have a process in which we're building a center to use for all demographics in our town. And what we also have coming down the pike is a school that is absolutely deplorable and is not able to be educating kids in. It's not safe. So we have to do something about that. So I know we have a center, we have something to do with Florence Roach, and we also have two other assets that have big question marks, which is the Country Club, and Prescott, in my mind. I'm really concerned that we're not taking a long time focus on all of these different huge, huge capital expenses. We're talking about $5 million for the center. We're talking about anywhere from 15 to $55 million for Florence Roach. This, it, it is starting to get a bit much. And then we also have our schools where we just don't have the funding from the state. We need to take a step back and be concerned how much monopoly we're going to be playing because this is not monopoly money. Thank you. Um, Mr. Platt and then Ms. Allen. Mr. Platt first. Go ahead. So Marlene, I, I would agree with you except for the fact that uh, it is highly likely that the funding for the renovation of Prescott School uh, will come out of CPC funds 
uh, when uh, Surrenden Farm debt service is done. Uh, and at that point, it will be the decision of town meeting uh, to decide whether uh, to fund a renovation, a larger project at Prescott. But the monies that would pay for that are highly likely to be monies that are outside of the town budget that will be paying for the center, that will be paying for the school. So it, it is a whole different pocket. Miss Ellen, in the wireless microphone. Miss Ellen, Main Street, I move the question, please. A motion has been made to move the question. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to move the question. A motion to move the question suppresses debate. It requires a two-thirds majority. If you vote in favor of the motion to move the question, we'll move directly to voting on the main motion under motion three. If you vote against moving the question, debate will continue. It requires a two-thirds majority. All in favor of moving the question signify by saying aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. Two thirds majority is achieved. The question is moved. The main motion under motion three requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. Motion three passes by a majority vote. <laughs> motion four, Mr. DeGroote. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town vote pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 44B, Section 5, to appropriate the sum of $18,000 from the Community Preservation Fund Historic Resource Reserve to fund Community Preservation Application 2019-04, J.D. Poor Mural Restoration. Motion four has been moved and seconded, Mr. DeGroote. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This article, would fund uh, a relocation of the uh, historic J.D. Poor murals from their current location uh, on Old Air Road in the Prescott House to a new temporary location at the new Groton Inn. Uh, with a presentation of Mr. Al Collins of the Groton History Center. And Mr. John Amaral, I believe representing the Groton Inn. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, before you, we have a very unique project. Um, in the early part of the 18th century, folk artists roamed New England, leaving in their path beautiful works of art. We happen to have a, a group of these uh, works of art in the form of wall murals in the Oliver Prescott House on Old Air Road. That house is presently owned by Indian Hill Music and the use of the house is presently unknown. So they've gifted the murals to the Groton History Center, who would love to make these murals available for everybody to enjoy. Uh, Indian Hill has committed to preserving these murals in some form and to keeping them in Groton, so that's why they've gifted them to the History Center. The problem is the murals have to be moved. Uh, John, J.D. Poor, these are done by Jonathan Poor, known as J.D. Poor, typically painted in more northern New England, but he found his way into the wonderful town of Groton back in 1835 and was commissioned to paint these in the Prescott House. Um, these murals wrap the entire room, this particular room, and you'll notice to the right-hand side this kind of a yellow uh, looks like a giant sun on the right hand side. Well, that's deterioration in the mural from years of exposure. That happens to be on an outer wall. So from the exterior freezing and warming and humidity and all that, the mural is starting to fall apart. So the mural to the left, uh, we call it the water mural, is one that we, will, uh, we plan to move. Now you might ask yourself, how do you move a wall mural? Well, believe it or not, there's somebody that specializes in doing such. He's moved about 100 murals throughout New England, um, typically out of private homes, quite often into museums, a few public places. Uh, and the process is uh, pretty detailed. Um, they first stabilize the front of the mural 
They put glue on the back of the mural, they open up the wall behind it, and then they surgically remove that piece of the wall that the mural is attached to. And they take that whole mural and transport it carefully and, and uh, reinstall it someplace else. <laughs> Next. So this is what happens to murals over time. This is another mural in the house that's just kind of disappearing. Um, the murals that we want to save at, at one point in time, I'm told, were uh, covered by wallpaper. So that's part of why they're in such good shape. So they really have to be, uh, have to be saved. We've had uh, conservatives look at the murals. They said they absolutely can be saved. They can be restored but they have to get out of this house as soon as possible. The house is presently not heated, and they're just slowly disappearing, and eventually they'll turn into sawdust. Next. So we just happen to have this unique project in town, which I'm sure you all know about. Um, all of the stars seem to be aligned. Uh, the Groton History Center is taking possession of these murals through what's called a deed of gift. Uh, the deed of gift has been drafted as presently in the hands of the attorneys to look over and schmooze a little bit. Um, but the issue is the Groton History Center is a volunteer organization. We don't have a lot of money, we don't have a uh, climate controlled environment that these murals could be kept in. And it just so happened that the Groton Inn was being built. So this is a tremendous collaboration of three groups of people in town that really care a lot about this town. Indian Hill was committed to keep these murals in Groton. The Groton History Center takes possession. We would like everybody to be able to enjoy them. And all of a sudden we have the Groton Inn, another great group of people who will be, uh, be able to display these murals in a controlled environment. And there'll be an agreement in place called an archival loan agreement. So they will be essentially loaning the murals from the Groton History Center. And I'm gonna turn this over to John Amaral, who's gonna tell you a few things that the, the Inn has done to, uh, to show these murals. Thank you, Al. John Amaral with the Groton Inn. Um, we were very honored when we were approached by the Groton History Center, as well as Indian Hill Music, uh, asking if we would participate in this collaboration. Although our building is new, we have a very keen understanding and sense of the history of this site and certainly of the center and the town of Groton. This is one way to put in a place of public viewing and the inn is open to the public 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't have to be staying there to come in and enjoy it. Uh, so we felt that this, this was something that we really needed to consider seriously and again we're honored that they approached us. We decided several months ago when this became uh, a possibility to invest in the building at, at two places in the lobby, uh, a sum of approximately $10,000 to construct suitable viewing stations for these. It required carpentry, electric, special lighting, and other work with, with, uh, within that space. The murals will be placed so that they can be moved on very short notice. If the Historic Society said, decides that they have another place to put them, whether it's in one of their buildings or someplace else that they feel would be more appropriate, it's not a big task to be able to move them. Uh, we also will be responsible for ensuring them and for making sure that they are always taken very good care of so long as they are in the inn itself. So again, we want to thank Indian Hill Music and the Groton Historical Society for allowing us the opportunity to participate with them. Floor is now open for debate. Any comments, questions? See someone moving to the microphone? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Dave Zeiler from Old Air Road, just down the road from this beautiful house. I love the concept of this um, project. I have some concerns about the fate of the Prescott house if these murals leave the house. Indian Hill has not demonstrated that they are committed to saving this house, and I think that this house is a, 
um, historic landmark. It is part of um, the farming community that they were so uh, very adamant that they wanted to preserve when they were building their, um, as they're building their new uh, music center. So I, I would love to support this, but I'm afraid if we lose something like this out of that house, before there's a commitment from Indian Hill to preserve that house, um, we, we'll lose a, 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 a leveraging, a, a bargaining chip. So I would like a commitment from Indian Hill that they are not going to destroy the Prescott House, and then I would be, I'd, be, I'd be willing to support um, this project. Thank you. Mr. Collins. Um, I can't say anything for Indian Hill, but one thing you have to understand is these murals no longer belong to the house. They've already been gifted to the History Center. They are not a piece of the house. So I'd like you not to think about that part of it. These are a totally separate project from the house. Um, and this is absolutely something that should be supported. Other comments on motion four? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Motion four passes by a majority vote. <laughs> motion five, Mr. Hewitt. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town vote pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws 44B, Section 5, to appropriate the sum of $30,000 from the Community Preservation Fund Open Space Reserve and to appropriate the sum of $110,000 from the Community Preservation Fund Unallocated Reserve for a total of $140,000 to fund Community Preservation Application 2019-05 Batacook Pond restoration. Motion five has been moved and seconded. Mr. Hewitt. So um, this may look familiar. Last year we did vote to fund, this is a three year project. Uh, we voted to fund the first two years and that's because CPC didn't have enough money to fund all three years. So now we're coming back for the third year. Uh, this is an attempt to preserve one of the major bodies of water, open bodies of water in town. And with that I'm gonna turn it over to project manager, Jim Lewing. Mr. Looning, the Great Ponds Advisory Committee, I believe, with a presentation. So for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, Batacook Pond, it's our largest natural pond. It's about 76 acres. Um, the town owns most of the abutting land, so it's very pristine around, the, around it. And uh, it's a key water resource. Part of it's the zone one protection area for one of the wells and uh, the entire pond is a zone two recharge area. It's also an important uh, biodiverse habitat and it's a year-round recreation uh, destination. It has a public boat launch at the northern end. If we go to the next slide. Um, Batacook is, has um, non-native invasive weeds that have grown over over the years, it hasn't really hasn't had a management plan up till this point. Um, and so about 35 acres are now uh, having invasive weeds in it. These invasive weeds de degrade the water quality, they accelerate eutrophication, they grow, into, grow up to 30 feet, and uh, they degrade the habitat for wildlife, fish, and birds. Uh, dense mats uh, increase safety risk for boaters and swimmers. Uh, weeds can entangle propellers for swimmers. It also creates a mosquito breeding ground and ca cause flooding. So this three-year pilot program was put together. Thank you. Um, to evaluate methods to control these. We've been working with the water department to find uh, a solution that works for them as well as, uh, um, as, well as the pond. Um, and so we're looking to evaluate control methods, determine actual uh, annual costs, um, and we're also conditioning the lake for ongoing maintenance during this three-year period. So clearing out high biomass areas, um, so those, those are areas too dense to even get in with a harvester. So um, we look at the pictures there that 
Uh, one at the top there is a harvester. Uh, that cuts the weeds down about five feet um, so they're well below the surface and it takes out the nutrients. The plants derive a majority of their nutrients from the water. So as we take out those nutrients, uh, part of the idea is that the, the growth will slow over time. It'll probably take a while to, to get to that state. Um, and the hydro rake we're also evaluating for weed removal and we're also using that to clear out uh, high biomass areas. Those are areas that are um, very thick with uh, just floating islands and things that we can't get through the harvester. Um, after the CPC project, it will be jointly managed between the town and the uh, water department. And so for year one and two, we had a budget of about 200K. I'll show you the results from, or at least a little bit of the results from year one. For year three, we need 140K to wrap up this project. And so if you flip to the next slide, um, hopefully you can see the difference there. I know our lights are not optimal. But that's the boat launch. That's the place probably people are most familiar with. And as you can see, there's kind of a tunnel going out um, around our harvester sitting there. And we've uh, cleared that back to what it was decades before when it was, when it was nice and clear. And also we've cleared out uh, weeds that uh, the boat trailers uh, would typically pull out, which actually endangers other ponds. Because now we're, if we spread these invasive weeds to other ponds, that's uh, a further problem. Um, so this, this, after the first year, we've seen very significant improvements. Uh, uh, there's less weed accumulation at the surface, more open water. We've cle cleared some of these high biomass areas. We've removed about uh, 900 cubic yards of plant material. Um, so for this third year, um, you know, we, we see this as uh, a valuable recreation resource. It's a key aquifer for our town, and I encourage you to vote for it. So that's it. There are questions or comments under motion five, Mr. Orcutt. Thomas Orcutt, Water Superintendent, the Board of Water Commissioners voted unanimously to support this article. Any comments or questions? Motion five requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Motion five passes by a majority vote. Motion six, Mr. Hewitt. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town vote pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws 44B, section five to appropriate from the fiscal year 2018 appropriation, the sum of $7,000 from the Community Preservation Fund Open Space Reserve and to appropriate the sum of $42,000 from the Community Preservation Fund Unallocated Reserve for a total of $49,000 to fund the Community Preservation Fund application, Community Preservation application 2019-08 Duck Pond Restoration. Motion six has been moved and seconded, Mr. Hewitt. So um, there's a, we have a number of large bodies of water in town, and they're all being threatened in some form or another. So in the case of um, Lost Lake, uh, specific applications of sonar to selected spots is being used. That approach was not appropriate for Batacook, the water department felt, because that's the town water supply, and they didn't want to take any chances with that. So therefore, in that situation, the one you just approved, that's more a physical process, a mechanical process of, of basically cutting the grass and, and digging things up. Now this one, uh, the duck pond, is another major body, and that's being threatened not by uh, in aquatic invasives, but rather by the um, excessive growth of native plants. And so this is an approach that we're going to be funding to uh, try and uh, attempt to, to control that. The reason why we're asking for funds from basically this year is so that they can start the project early uh, and maximize the potential rather than wait until July 1st. And with that, Bob Anderson. With the presentation, Mr. Anderson. Duck Pond is a 26-acre great pond that you may not be familiar with. It's located between Wiley Road and Duck Pond Drive. It has a lot of public access in that two-thirds of the land around it are owned 
by either Groton Conservation Trust or the town through the Groton Conservation Commission. And there are trails along both the north side on the Conservation Trust property and the east side on the uh, Conservation Commission property. The, they're accessible from Duck Pond Drive, Little Hall Lane, and on the north from uh, Lost Lake Drive. So this project, as, as was mentioned, is a, a different approach, and it's one that uh, we feel makes sense because we do not have invasive weeds in Duck Pond, so we don't have the same urgency that there was at Lost Lake or at Batacook Pond. But the, the pond is eutrophying. It's turning into a marsh. All, all ponds do that, but this is happening much too fast for comfort. And we're trying to slow that process or even reverse that process. So it's about a $60,000 project. We've raised $13,000 from very generous neighbors to get started early. And uh, we're looking for $49,000 uh, in, this, in this thing. Um, the, this project meets actually very specifically meets the goals and objectives of both the town master plan and the conservation commission open space and recreation plan primarily in terms of preserving open water for recreation purposes uh, i will save some time um, so that you don't have to listen to eight different committees giving their support we have the support of the groton conservation commission the groton conservation trust the board of water commissioners the groton lakes association the great pond advisory committee and, uh, and of course the uh, Community Preservation Committee. We also have very broad support from the neighbors through emails that were part of the application and as I say, $13,000 that we raised. Next slide. So a few years ago, this is what it looked like. Um, basically, it, it's very, very popular from a hiking standpoint because of the very nice viewscapes, both around the north side and the east side. We also have people that actually bring in kayaks or canoes. And there used to be a lot of fishermen, not so much anymore, and that's one aspect of the pond eutrophying and not having the same amount of wildlife. But we're trying to restore it to, to look like this. Uh, but meanwhile, we invite you to come take a look at it. Next slide. This is what it looked at like more recently. Um, the weeds have gotten thicker and earlier in the year, and that's both a recreation barrier, if you have a paddle or a device with a fin on it, it's pretty hard going through all that, uh, all those weeds. And it's a safety hazard. We've seen uh, teenagers out there frolicking around and falling out of boats and everything. And if they're in an area with very heavy weeds, that's just plain dangerous. Next slide. There's also a lot of muck. That's a scientific term for uh, sediment. Um, it's several feet deep. And I'm not kidding, you can go into up to your knee in this stuff and not get your knee back out without a lot of help. Uh, that's both a danger to anyone, anyone falling in, and it's also a barrier to recreation. If you look at the picture on the right, once the water goes down a bit in the summer, you can't even get to the water. Um, so it, it kills the recreation. Next slide. So th this is sort of a summary of what I just said. It's eutrophying, we'd like to slow that process of it turning into a marsh. The symptoms are the rapid increase in weeds, thicker and thicker muck, and a decrease in the amount of wildlife. The other impacts are the safety hazard and the recreation barrier. Next slide. So the cause, the cause, like in all ponds, of the increased weeds are the nutrients, in this case, primarily phosphorus. And because of the very increasing amount of biomass that's decaying each year, uh, there's more and more phosphorus to provide a nutrient to next year's weed growth. There's also increased muck, and that's because all that decaying stuff uses up the dissolved oxygen that's at the bottom of the pond. That kills the aerobic bacteria that usually eats the muck. It makes it possible for anaerobic bacteria to come in, and that causes hydrogen sulfide and um, other bad effects. Mainly, it also causes a dead zone along the bottom, so you lose the, uh, the zooplankton, the insects, the fish, the, the otters, and so on up the food chain. So the solution we're going to try is a submersed aeration system that basically is a compressor that puts through 10 hoses to 10 different sets of diffusers around the pond, a stream of air that gets some circulation going up and around and back down. And basically, it brings the oxygen-rich surface level of water down to the bottom where you need it for the aerobic bacteria. So what happens is the aerobic bacteria comes back the insects thrive, the fish thrive, the wildlife recovers, and the fishermen thrive as well, I guess. 
Uh, primarily, more muck is consumed if the aerobic bacteria doesn't get killed. And finally, if you have sufficient oxygen at that level, it locks the phosphorus into a form that is less of a nutrient, less available as a nutrient to the weeds. So hopefully it will slow weed growth as well. Next slide. Well, the part that's not under the floodlights you can see up top, it's just basically a map of the pond showing the locations of the 10 diffusers and the length of hose that's necessary from the compressor, which is that white spot at the next to, next to Wiley Road, to all those places. So we'd like to ask your support for this, and I'm take any questions, if there are any. Any questions or comments under motion six? Floor is open for debate. Requires a majority vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. Motion six passes by a majority vote. We now move on to Article 18. Mr. George Moore. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, George Moore, Groton Agricultural Commission. This article um, was approved by the state, uh, I think, about two years ago, maybe uh, three. Mr. Moore? Yes. Sir. Sorry, we need you to make the motion first. Oh. Before we can discuss it. I move that the town vote to accept uh, section 81 of no, chapter 40 8L. of the general. I'm sorry? 8L of chapter 40. 8L of chapter 40 of the general laws as added by section 23 of chapter 218 of the Acts of 2016, in order to expand the powers and duties of the Agricultural Commission established by Chapter 5, Agricultural Commission of the Town Code, and vote to amend the code by deleting Chapter 5 in its entirety and inserting in place thereof a new Chapter 5 as set forth in the warrant. Article 18 has been moved and seconded. It's on pages 17 and 19 in the warrants. Mr. Moore, now. This will enable um, the Agricultural Commission to work closely with the Conservation Commission who have given their support to this, uh, to this article. Uh, the idea being that uh, pieces, parcels of land in town which have agricultural potential, agricultural value, uh, would be better managed by the Agricultural Commission the charter for the Agricultural Commission uh, states that there will be three out of the five members of the AgCom uh, who need to be full-time farmers. And we feel that this will uh, give a little more knowledge, a little more expertise to the, to the handling, to the management of agricultural value of some of these parcels. Thank you, sir. Article 18. It's now on the floor, it's open for debate. Are there questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, Peter Morrison from the Conservation Commission. On January 23rd, the Conservation Commission voted unanimously to support this article. There are other questions, comments, debate on Article 18. Requires a majority vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Article 18 passes by a unanimous vote. <laughs> Article 19, Mrs. Pine. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town vote to accept the Nashua, Squanacook, and Nisitissit Rivers Stewardship Plan developed by the Nashua River Wild and Scenic River Study Committee together with its recommendation to seek wild and scenic river designation. Article 19 has been moved and seconded. Mrs. Pine, did you have anything further? I just want to point out that this is explained on pages 48 and 49 in the packet and report to you that the select board supports this unanimously. And I understand that Stacy Chilcote is going to explain it. That's correct. Stacy Chilcote is the River Classroom and Environmental Education Director of the National River Watershed Association. She could come forward. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Chilcote has asked to play a video. The video includes three non-voters, Bill Wil Wilkinson of Townsend, Lucy Wallace, chair of the Nashua River Wild and Scenic River Study Committee, and a member of the Harvard Board of Selectmen. 
and Mr. Jamie For Fosberg, manager of the Northeast Region Rivers Program for the National Park Service. As with non-voters who wish to address the meeting in person, the chair will seek the permission of the meeting to show the video that features non-voters advocating for this motion. Are there any objections? Hearing on the chair will allow the playing of the video. Can we dim the lights, perhaps? Nobody fall asleep. I have been standing in them. I've hiked Maybe along the their banks. I've canoed and kayaked and gone swimming in these rivers. I am an avid fly fisherman. I fish for uh, trout in the Mississippi and the Squanacook and largemouth bass in the Nashua. I have spent many, many hours on each of those rivers and find that they're the jewel of this area. The Wild and Scenic Rivers Act was passed by the U.S. Congress 50 years ago to preserve rivers in this country that are unique and special. The Nashua, Squanacook, and Nissitissit rivers are outstanding in many ways, from their rich scenic, recreational, historic, and cultural values to their unique biodiversity. And in 2018, if voters in 11 towns along these rivers vote in the affirmative at their annual town meetings, the Nashua, Squanacook, and Nissitissit rivers will become eligible for this distinguished wild and scenic designation. These rivers have been such a valuable part of these communities. And there were stewards of these properties, these rivers before us. We have a responsibility to be stewards now and going forward. Three years ago, 11 communities along these rivers appointed individuals to serve on the Nashua River Wild and Scenic River Study Committee. Their task was to identify the many resources and opportunities for improvements. As part of their work, and with much public input, the committee developed the Voluntary River Stewardship Plan, a future guide to protect and enhance what is special about these rivers. When I first heard about the Nashua River Wild and Scenic River Study, I was not sure what it would mean to the towns that would, were included in the study area. I wasn't sure if there would be additional federal regulation that would be imposed on the communities. And I wasn't really sure how it would impact the landowners along the river. It's understandable for people to have those questions and concerns. It's absolutely not about creating a federal river park. We would have no land use management authority. We're not going to affect hunting or fishing or any of the other practices that are occurring right now on the river. What it is about is empowering local communities to care for a resource that they care deeply about already. Uh, that's the whole idea of the uh, voluntary stewardship plan, to place communities out front and provide a framework for them to work together to protect those special river values. With approval of the plan, we will be able to work on improving water quality. We can also work on educating the public about the value of the river and the resources and work on opening the rivers for better and safer boating that people really enjoy, perhaps by controlling invasives. The Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers program is all about local action, local commitment, and local leadership. There are seven Partnership Wild and Scenic Rivers in New England, and importantly, uh, New Hampshire has a great model in the Lamprey River in the Seacoast area, which has a 20-year success history, and right nearby here, the Concord, Sudbury, and Assabet Rivers have a similar 20-year success history. This is a great opportunity for the towns to continue to work on improving their river. There's no cost to the town in participating in this plan, and in fact, there's the opportunity for federal funding to help us do our work. These three rivers are so precious and have been here long before we were. They'll be here long after we are. We have a responsibility to be good stewards of the river and be able to pass it on to the next generation. To learn more about this wild Ms. Jilko. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So I'm Stacy Chilko, 210 Chicopee Row. I am one of two Groton representatives to the Nashua River Wild and Scenic Study Committee, along with Nadia Madden. 
Today we ask the Groton residents to accept the Nashua, Squanacook, and Nisitissit Rivers Stewardship Plan developed by the River Study Committee and with much public input and to accept its recommendation to seek wild and scenic river designation. Four towns have already passed this regional article and seven more, including Groton, are voting over the next few weeks. What will the wild and scenic river designation do for our community? It will qualify these three remarkable rivers for annual National Park Service funds and will help to leverage additional funds through priority status on grant applications. It will protect the rivers from adverse actions, including new dams. And designation could help prevent the potentially negative effects of activities such as in-stream utility line crossings. It will create a partnership between 11 towns, the Nashua River Watershed Association, and the National Park Service, which brings expertise and funding to help protect our shared resources. The wild and scenic designation does not stop development. It does not affect local zoning or property rights, and it does not cost the town any money. It does not change hunting, fishing, or boating laws. We will have a locally based stewardship council with Groton representatives, which will implement the river stewardship plan. What does the stewardship plan do? It recommends voluntary steps to protect water quality, promotes awareness and education, and define strategies to protect and enhance the outstanding values of these rivers. These values include the exceptional bio biological diversity of life, recreational and scenic aspects, and cultural and historical aspects such as the Marion Stoddard story and the cleanup of the Nashua River. Examples of recommended actions in the stewardship plan supporting these values include raising awareness about streams, protecting threatened species, addressing aquatic invasives, maintaining existing access for boaters and supporting new access points for recreational use, maintaining and restoring river-related historic sites. Please vote yes to accept the River Stewardship Plan for the future of our local rivers, our outstanding remarkable resources, and the opportunity to become designated wild and scenic rivers. This is a win-win for us all. Thank you for your support. The chair will now open the floor for debate. There are comments and questions under Article 19. Yes, Mr. Morrison. Yes, on uh, April 10th, the Conservation Commission voted unanimously to support this article. In the back, yes, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Adam Burnett. I'm the chair of the Groton Greenway Committee. And uh, on April 25th, we voted unanimously to support uh, this uh, motion and to support uh, the uh, recommendation for these three rivers to be uh, added to the Wild and Scenic River designation. Thank you. Mr. Berenger. Yes, thank you, Mr. Moderator. At uh, the Planning Board's regular meeting on April 12th, the Board voted unanimously to recommend approval of this article uh, to accept these rivers in this uh, stewardship plan and to seek a uh, wild and river, scenic river designation. Uh, simply put, this uh, proposal is consistent with and supports the current town master plan in maintaining uh, valuable conservation areas and, and recreation areas. So the board supports it unanimously. Floor is open for debate. Other questions or comments on Article 19? Seeing none, the chair will call for the vote. Article 19 requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Article 19 passes by a unanimous vote. <laughs> Article 20, Mr. Burke. Mr. Moderator, I would uh, beg your indulgence that we take Article 20 and 21 uh, together and vote on them separately. Yes, we'll move Article 20 first, 
And then Mr. Burke will give a presentation that encompasses Article 20 and Article 21 together. Debate will be allowed on 20 and 21. When we finish with 20, we'll then vote on 21. Uh, should clear? I make... Why don't you uh, move Article 20 first? I move the town vote to amend the Code of Town of Groton, Chapter 218, zoning as follows. Amend Section 218-16.2, temporary moratorium on recreational marijuana establishments by deleting the words June 30th, 2018 and Section 218-16.2.C, parentheses 1, and replacing it with the words December 31st, 2018, and adding the words, and the Attorney General approves, after the word adopts. Article 20 has been moved and seconded. Mr. Burke. I move that the town vote to amend. Uh, no, sir. So we, we can only have one main motion on the floor at a time. Okay. But the chair will allow discussion of Article 20 and Article 21 simultaneously. Very because good. you have a longer presentation, so you'll now have up to 14 minutes to well, discuss both articles. I will try not to go the entire 14 minutes, e even though I know everyone loves zoning. Uh, okay. Um, as you may or may not know that uh, as of uh, uh, 2016, uh, recreational marijuana is now the law of the land. And by virtue of the vote that the town uh, voted in the 2016 referendum, Groton is a community that's deemed to have opted in. And with that uh, designation, if we do not have zoning in place, uh, if we are uh, selected by a marijuana establishment to, to seek permission, our zoning would be no more rigorous than somebody with a shoe store coming forward to the town. Uh, there is a provision under the state law 94G that allows for communities to opt out, uh, but that is a rather high bar that requires a very rigorous process and a likelihood of uncertainty uh, if it would be successful. Next slide, please. With the new law, the state control and jurisdiction shifts from the Department of Public Health to a newly formed Cannabis Control Commission. They are responsible for the operation and security of marijuana establishments. Next slide, please. The current status in Groton is we have a medical marijuana zoning in place. However, that those provisions are not adequate uh, for recreational marijuana. We also have in place a temporary moratorium that was adopted in the 2017 fall town meeting that created a temporary moratorium on recreational marijuana establishments that's set to expire the end of June of this year. Meanwhile, the State Cannabis Control Commission has started accepting applications as of April 1st and will be issuing licenses on June 1st of this year. To my knowledge, we have not been approached with any applications. Next slide, please. Under the general laws, communities may regulate the time and place. They may limit the number of retail establishments. However, they may, may be no less than 20% of the number of licensed liquor establishments for retail marijuana establishments. In the case of Groton, that would mean one. It also allows communities to adopt performance standards in their zoning to regulate some of the aspects and impacts that might be anticipated from such establishments. We're also allowed to adopt sign regulations. However, the law stipulates they can be no more rigorous or restrictive than what currently exists for retail alcohol establishments. And it also allows the town to establish criminal penalties 
uh, fog, fog violation similar to the alcohol beverages. Next slide, please. There's a whole pantheon of marijuana establishments. This slide just represents some of the, mar the uh, better known types of uh, mar marijuana establishments that we would anticipate seeing. Our zoning also includes a catch-all that um, any licensed marijuana business to catch it all. You notice in that slide that one of the circles is X'd out, that is on-site consumption. Under the state law 94G, on-site consumption is not permissible unless a community opts in. By that it means a community must have a referendum that can only be held concurrent with the state by annual election and then the town would also have to ad adopt provisions in their local regulations to allow it. Next slide, please. I drive by this place every day on my way to work. This is a, a marijuana, medical marijuana establishment in the town of Ayr on Central Ave, located behind the post office and ironically right across the street from the uh, Neshoga Board of Health. A lot of people don't know it's, it's there, but I just thought I would show what they look like. Next sl slide. So what can we control locally? Uh, the law has this uh, phrase that uh, finds its way into a lot of state regulations. We, we cannot adopt any regulations that are unreasonably impracticable. And that allows us to extend the moratorium. It allows us to, uh, to, a, to a certain time. Uh, we have been advised by the Attorney General that communities may extend to the end of the calendar year. That would give communities time to put in place the necessary regulatory regimen. However, if you extend beyond that, the Attorney General's office has indicated they would lose their sense of humor in terms of how far you can extend a moratorium without opting out as provided in the law. We can regulate the time and place. We can establish zoning buffers, setbacks from sensitive types of uses. Uh, we can adopt performance standards that deal with such issues as traffic, noise, air quality. Uh, and we can also uh, prohibit, as I previously mentioned, on-site consumption. So our proposed zoning approach, as previously noted, we have two articles before you. The first is simply an extension of the current moratorium to the end of this year, extending it from June 30th to December 31st. We've also added language to that to include language that says that it would be in place until zoning is adopted by the town to regulate recreational marijuana and approved by the Attorney General. Uh, in Massachusetts, all towns zoning goes before the, the Attorney General's office for approval and sometimes they find technical difficulties and do not approve it. So we've added that language just as a safeguard in case uh, uh, the attorney general, in case we approve it and the attorney general does not approve it, we're left uh, without regulations in place. And we're pro proposing both of them. Really, it's a, a belt and suspenders approach. Uh, our intention and, and recommendation is that this, the zoning article 21 be adopted and upon its adoption and then approval by the Attorney General, the moratorium would be superseded. Next slide, please. Uh, our proposed zoning is essentially taking the current medical marijuana regulations, repealing them and replacing them with new regulatory provisions that include much of what is in place with medical marijuana but establishing more detailed performance standards as well as putting in place a, a process uh, under which they are reviewed, which would be both a special permit 
and site plan review from the planning board. Next slide, please. This slide I'm not going to read, read to you, but essentially these five sections, which take up maybe a, a third of a page in our zoning bylaw, are what we have in place currently for medical marijuana. Uh, we were under the gun, as most communities were, when medical marijuana came on the scene, so we put something in place, and in hindsight is probably not the most rigorous or expansive, but uh, it allowed us to have some form of uh, regulatory uh, protection in, in place. Next slide, please. These are some of the land use issues of concern. Uh, signage we, we talked about previously. Uh, the display and packaging would reside with the Cannabis Control Commission. They have regulations that prohibit any public, dis any display of products or advertising that are visible from uh, public areas. Uh, buffers, I'll talk about, uh, are covered through local zoning. Noise, odor, uh, Parking and traffic are some things that we can cover. Security is something that the Cannabis Control Commission has reserved for their own purposes, um, and they are going to be the entity that will be policing things. Next slide, please. Buffers, the only buffer that's mentioned in the state law is that no establishment may be located within 500 feet of a K through 12 education use. That, however, does not preclude communities from adopting buffers from other sensitive uses. So we will have, and we have proposed in place uh, setbacks that would include parks, religious institutions, colleges, other marijuana establishments, daycare, library. And the 500 foot buffer is determined from property line to property line. Next slide, please. The schedule of use regulations, the one that people always talk about, well, what do all those yeses and SPs and Ns and dashes mean? Uh, that is basically what's allowed in, in what districts. In the case of the recreational marijuana, we're proposing no expansion of any district than what currently allows medical marijuana establishments. So that means in the general business and in the industrial district, recreational marijuana establishments will be allowed. However, in the general business district, only retail and testing marijuana establishments will be allowed. And the reason we're doing that is one of the provisions of the state law says that we cannot restrict any type of marijuana establishment. So there has to be a place for every type of establishment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to read the four or five pages we have of the proposed language. It's in your, uh, your handout. But it's broken into five sections of, uh, of, well, seven if we include the definitions. We have added new definitions. We've uh, revised the use regulations, put new SPs, and different types of uses in, in place. And then the meat of the uh, regulations are broken into these five categories, purpose, applicability, the general requirements and conditions, the special permit requirements, and also provisions for the abandonment or discontinuance of use. <laughs> Mr. Burke, uh, as this is a change in zoning, could you give maybe just a formal report of the planning board, which is required by law? For just Article 20 at this point. Right, that's correct, yes. The planning board held a public hearing on February 8th, 2018, relative to its proposed zoning amendment to extend the temporary moratorium on recreational marijuana establishments. The Planning Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 20. Thank you, sir. Uh, with a committee report for the Board of Selectmen, Mrs. Pine. Uh, 
the select board unanimously supports all three, actually, of the marijuana-related articles, and we very strongly urge voters to vote in favor of them. Um, because if we don't pass the zoning that's proposed here tonight, Groton will not have any legal way to regulate or control the location and operation of marijuana-related retail or agricultural operations after July 1st, when the Commonwealth has said that such facilities may open for business. This is why we strongly urge you to vote in favor of these articles. Um, but we know, we have anticipated that there are some people who are not wanting any marijuana-related activity or businesses in Groton. And so um, there is, this is where the eight marijuana-related ballot questions come in. And with the permission of the moderator, if I may do so. Yes, go ahead. Um, I would like to give you a brief explanation about the ballot questions. The eight ballot questions, which are numbered two through nine, are printed on page three of the warrant that was mailed to you. But more importantly, they are explained in this separate handout, which was out there called ballot question, 2018 ballot question. Um, this is also, I believe, going to be mailed to everyone. Uh, we strongly urge you to read this. After the referendum vote in November 2016, the Commonwealth created rules that, uh, saying that towns that voted in favor of the question have to go through a more difficult process to ban marijuana than towns that voted against it. Since Groton voted 56% in favor of the original question, if we now want to ban commercial or agricultural marijuana activities in Groton, we have to follow a very specific process. The process begins with the eight ballot questions, which address the eight specific categories of commercial and agricultural marijuana activity that will be allowed in Massachusetts. Uh, we will be voting on those ballot questions at the election two weeks from tomorrow. If there is a strong vote on these questions to allow marijuana activities in Groton, the zoning regulations which we are hopefully going to enact tonight will be in place to provide reasonable limits and create the conditions for these activities to begin operations. If, on the other hand, there is a strong vote on these ballot questions to ban marijuana activities, the planning board will begin working on creating zoning regulations to prohibit them. These will be brought to the fall, fall town meeting for a vote where they would need a two-thirds majority to pass, like any zoning regulations. If they pass, ballot questions endorsing them will then be placed on the November election ballot. Under the rules created by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, this is the only way for Groton to prohibit marijuana-related operations. Uh, these eight ballot questions are non-binding but they are the only way for your elected leaders to know what the will of the people is regarding marijuana activities in Groton. The select board has placed these eight questions on the ballot for the May election, but the select board has taken no position either for or against the ballot questions. However, I want to say this again, the select board does have a very strong opinion on the marijuana-related articles that are before us tonight. We urge you to vote in favor of them, even if you are opposed to marijuana, because these regulations are the only legal control over marijuana activities that we will have after July 1st. Thank you. The floor is now open for debate on Article 20, which is to extend the moratorium on recreational marijuana establishments from June 30th to December 31st of 2018. Are there any questions or comments? I see a gentleman moving to the microphone. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Paul Funch, Reedy Meadow Road. I wonder if you could clarify the um, wording in uh, Section 218, 16.2 that you're going to modify by the Article 20. 
Um, is that that's the change that would remove that suspension once the um, The, amend the amendments to the uh, zoning laws is approved by the attorney general. That is that is correct. It basically so, states that uh, the moratorium will be in place until December 31st of this year, or until such time as the town adopts regulations for marijuana, for mar recreational marijuana, and the attorney general approves said. Uh, vote by the town. Okay, it just would help to see so those words that are being modified in the motion. Yes. So thank you. Okay. Other comments? Yes, ma'am. Leslie Lathrop, Sunset Road. I was just wondering if you know what other towns around us have done in regards to the moratorium. Mr. Burke? Um, I do not have a, uh, I, I believe Westward has voted no. I don't know what if What is no, no meaning? They have opted out. They do, are not a community that is deemed to be, uh, have opted in. I believe AIR has voted, yes, they already have a, a medical marijuana establishment, and my understanding is they're already processing a recreational marijuana establishment in, in their town. I do not know what other communities are doing. Yeah, I'm concerned that we may lose an opportunity for income if other towns beat us to the punch. We're not concerned with that. Our concern is that as, as we stand right now under the state law, we're a community that if somebody comes knocking on the door and if we do not have zoning in place, they will get the same rigorous review as a shoe store. Which makes no, sense. Nothing against the shoe store, by No, the that way. makes sense for the zoning, but it doesn't make sense for the moratorium. The moratorium is simply a belt and suspenders. If for some reason the proposed zoning were to be adopted here that went to the Attorney General and was disapproved because of a technical glitch, we still have the moratorium in place in order to rectify the situation. Yes, sir, in the back. Yes, sir. Mr. Hargraves. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> First of all, I <clears throat> have a little experience with this, but I do want to uh, take my hat off to the planning board and to the selectmen on urging the passage of these three articles. We do have, as you see on page three, these questions. Now, some of you don't know this, so I mean, I did have another life before the legislature and that was 25 years as a school principal. The bulk of those, a high school principal, and I was principal just west of here, about six miles, when this, the inception of drugs into schools. I've seen it for 25 years. And marijuana, and I think that our uh, SRO officer, made a, a, a statement, which I totally agree with, that the marijuana, and I'm not going to try to get people to go one way or the other when they check off those questions, but she said it's the gateway. I've seen them all. I've seen them passed out in the, where they had to be taken to the hospital. The best thing I could do as a high school principal was to drive it as deep as I could so that it was very difficult to take and abuse that in the school setting. And I know there are people in this audience that uh, remember me one a uh, few years ago, but I can just say in all seriousness, just think twice when you are checking off those questions. Do you want to go in this direction to make it easier I know there's rules and regulations. There's also rules and regulations on driving automobiles. There's rules and regulations on drinking behind the wheel. But it does happen. What this is going to do, from what my perspective, is it is going to make it easier. And it's a beginning. 
And I've seen, I could name it, Mary, Mary Jane, marijuana, however you want to say it. I heard every word in the book, and roofies, and you name it. Anyway, I think I've said enough. I'm going to sit down. Thank you. Are there other comments or debate? Seeing none, the chair will call a vote. Article 20 requires a two-thirds majority. All those in favor of Article 20 signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. Article 20 passes by a two-thirds majority. Are there seven voters who wish to challenge a ruling of the chair? 21. Seeing none, we'll move to Article 21. Mr. Burke will need to move it and second it, and then remind us what we're voting on, we're debating. Uh, I move that the town vote to amend the code of the town of Groton, Chapter 218, zoning as follows. By amending Section 218-4, Section 218-13, and Section 218-16.1 as set forth in the warrant. Article 21 has been moved and seconded. It's pages 20 to 24 in the warrants. This is the change to the zoning, Mr. Burke. Uh, may I read the report of the planning board? Sure, that would be good. The planning board held a public hearing on February 8, 2018, relative to its proposed amendment to establish zoning provisions for recreational marijuana establishments. The planning board unanimously recommends approval of Article 21. Is there any further debate on this issue? The floor is open for debate on Article 21, the changes to zoning. I see a couple of people getting up. Yes, ma'am. Kathy Reif, Wallace Road. Um, I'm just wondering if these changes will make uh, retail establishments for marijuana more restricted than alcohol establishments. And why, if so? Mr. Burke. I think they will be more restrictive in the terms of retail establishments can be limited to only 20% of the number of licensed retail alcohol establishments. So in that case, yes, it is more restrictive. Uh, with respect to The zoning aspects, I would say yes, because presently alcohol establishments are treated like any other retail store. There are not special provisions in place governing alcohol establishments that distinguishes it from other retail establishments. In the case of recreational marijuana retail establishments, uh, we've put in place a, a, what we believe is a, as rigorous a uh, regulatory structure that is permissible under the state law, which is more, more restrictive than what would be faced by an alcohol establishment. There are other questions or comments? Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah. John Aziz, uh, Cypress Road. Um, I am curious about the cultivation aspect of it, where it says here no more than one uh, retail Um, that seems kind of strange to me if this is supposed to be a right to farm community and you know that's it it's an asset for the town is the way I see it it's uh, it's very similar to agriculture I don't know why you would want to limit that to only one one place of business the state has ruled that cultivation of marijuana is not entitled to the agricultural exemption I understand that, that, that. is allowed by other agricultural endeavors. And they, they are permissible and- Industrial, right? Would be in the, in uh, the industrial area. And uh, we cannot restrict, uh, the, the way the state law is written, it's, it's kind of odd because it only gave a number to retail establishments, the 20%. Uh, but it also says that you can't restrict any type of marijuana establishments. So that means 
we have to allow at least one other type. That could be agricultural, it could be a testing facility, it, it could be a processing. But uh, what I'm saying is, say you have a testing facility, that means nobody else can have a, uh, any type of business whatsoever other than that one re or that retail and testing facility, correct? There'd be no if, option for a cultivator. If somebody comes in and, and gets the other one, yes, unless this body then revises the, the zoning to allow for more. Yeah, that would be my concern. Okay. I'm going to call on people as I saw them. I believe there's another gentleman at this microphone who was... No? Then I'll move over here. Yes, sir? Holden Lathrop, Sunset Road. I move the question. There's a motion to move the question. Do I hear a second? A motion to move the question requires a two-thirds majority. It suppresses debate. If you vote to move the question, we will move directly to voting on the main motion under Article 21. If you vote against moving the question, debate will continue. All those in favor of the motion to move the question, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Chair rules that the two-thirds majority is not achieved. There are seven voters who wish to challenge the ruling of the chair. Seeing none, debate will continue. Yes, sir. Mr. Moderator, Bob Lockett, 34 Kemp. Uh, just a question of clarification, Mr. Burke. In the presentation, you said that uh, in a retail district, manufacturing would not be allowed per the, uh, per the zoning, the changes in the zoning. Is the converse also true? It will retail be allowed in an industrial zoned area under these new provisions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, over here, yes, sir, on the left. Yes, uh, Mr. Moderator, Mark Presti, 230 Fieldstone Drive. Just a question, uh, what kind of guidance um, and consultation uh, is being mm -hmm. sought and provided in terms of the development of these regulations? I mean, I think there's going to be a pretty good body of, of experience and uh, expertise. Uh, is it being uh, sought just locally, or are we looking further afield? Are we uh, sure that we're developing best practices? That's all. Thank you. Mr. Burke. Uh, I, I happen to have drafted marijuana legislation for other communities um, as part of my job. Uh, so I've been fairly up to date in terms of what other communities are doing, what the state law allows, and I think Groton has, I hopefully, benefited from my input in the preparation of this zoning proposal. Uh, yes, if sir. I could just add to that, I appreciate that, and thank you. Um, so, are, have we consulted, consulted or, or sought consult uh, from places uh, like uh, communities in Colorado, where they've uh, got a fairly long, uh, well, as it pertains to this issue at this point, uh, body of experience? Uh, do you intend to seek out, out any of that expertise? Uh, and is has the public been provided any kind of a comparative? Uh, we've had, we have not done comparatives with Colorado. We've been focusing on Chapter 94G, which is the state law that we are dealing with. And we are basically putting together zoning that falls within the four squares of what that law allows communities to do. Keep in mind that the original referendum in 2016 was a law that was proposed by the marijuana industry. And so it was very favorable towards, towards establishments. Um, and also that the provisions for opting out that Mrs. Pine alluded to uh, sets a fairly high bar. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Paul Funch, Reedy Meadow Road. Um, just an observation that um, the, the restrictions that are put into the planning board regulations, um, you know, singling out this uh, type of business really it doesn't square with, I think, most people's understanding of, of these kinds of establishments. And, and, you know, Groton pretty overwhelmingly voted in favor of, 
legal marijuana and this, as this, the state did. And, you know, I think it's, it's hiding your head in the sand to um, put regulations out that, that restrict these businesses to the corners of the industrial districts in town. And, you know, I, I was out in Portland, Oregon uh, about a half a year ago, and, and the establishments are just <coughs> right where all the other businesses are, and there's no, you know, problems in those neighborhoods. There's no, you know, there's nothing wrong. People don't see that there's anything uh, unusual at all. So I, you know, I think it may take our town a little while to come to that understanding, but I think, you know, meanwhile, the next article really doesn't serve much purpose because I don't think you've made the town friendly to those businesses. And so trying to get some tax revenue from businesses, you have to encourage them to come to our town. And I think it's just a little short-sighted that we're not doing that. If, if yes, I may, Mr. Uh, Mr. Burke, yeah. Uh, you, you have a, a good point, Paul, that uh, we're, the planning board is trying to be agnostic with respect to the uh, merits or uh, lack of merits of marijuana establishments. And we've put together what we believe is uh, a, a first step, uh, if you would, or what is the minimum that we have to do to comply with the state law, which is not to say that as time goes by, attitudes change and the town may look more favorably, but we felt that approaching it with a conservative first step would be most uh, effective in putting in place some, some regulatory structure and the town may in the future decide differently. Mr. Lyman. Thank you. <clears throat> While personally I think this is something we don't want to do, I think marijuana and any, and alcohol for that matter, um, one wants to be very careful with. But the point here that I'm thinking of is that security becomes important, and then liquor stores have the same problem, but a store uh, as such is a building usually, and it can be secured. Uh, growing something, agriculture, uh, if it's out in the open, you have to have a fence and all the rest of that, and it could possibly be an attractive nuisance. Uh, if it's an indoor establishment, depending on the size of it, it could be quite a large building. Um, I don't really care one way or the other, but I just wanted to mention these points. Um, I would, Mr. Burke. Uh, the security issue is an interesting issue because people are concerned ab ab about that and some communities have, uh, under medical marijuana, had put forward very elaborate security provisions with the police department, etc. The current regulations adopted by the Cannabis Control Commission set forth a, a seed to sale policy where they want to have control from the germination of the seed to the ultimate sale, have it accounted for uh, and tracked. And so the sec security really rests with the Cannabis Control Commission. I might add that in our town currently, we have establishments that contain pharmaceuticals and narcotics that are far more powerful than, than marijuana. We don't have in place any provisions regarding the security of, of those establishments or by that matter financial institutions that keep funds, cash on deposit and other valuables. So I, I, I believe uh, while those are concer concerns and with respect to the agricultural aspect, the cultivation, uh, that has to be done under very controlled conditions. and. To my knowledge, I do not believe any outdoor marijuana establishments are, are going to be permitted because it is difficult to control uh, the seed to sale aspects of the regulations. In the back here, uh, yes, sir. 
Don Torgerson, uh, Station Avenue. Um, I just wanted to say again that the uh, restricting it only to two businesses being a retail and one other avenue of the five avenues of how uh, to work with marijuana is kind of, um, I, th I just don't agree with putting restrictions to business opportunities, especially a lot of it being based in agricultural to be not allowed in town. I just don't get that at all. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. I think, you know, we should be, it, this, this is here, it's coming, it's here to stay. Let's be in the front of it, let's not be in the back of it. We have a plow on our, on our uh, logo. <laughs> in the back to my right, yes sir, you. Yes, my name is Adam Burnett, I'm on Gratuity Road, Groton. And I'd like to make a motion to amend this motion. I'm not sure exactly how to do that, but what I'd like to do is strike the uh, provision that is under C5C, which states the number of non-retail marijuana establishments shall not exceed one. I'd like to strike that, that statement. Do you, okay, do you have that in writing? I could make that in writing. Okay, perhaps town council could help us form that motion. Would you, are you proposing just to strike it or to replace it with something? I think just strike it because that would allow the planning board to uh, limit uh, several or one or more establishments based on the other provisions, which are highly restrictive to begin with. So I, uh, you would have the control about how many ultimately. It would just be a matter of that it would not be restricted to just one. No, what we have proposed is the bare minimum of what you can have because if we have a retail establishment that is licensed first and then we have a non-retail establishment come forward and we say no to that establishment, we are not allowing all, we are, are we not making all types of marijuana establishments of, available in the town? What so I'm, what it's, I'm one, saying, it's one plus the one. And the 20% is something that is not in regulation, but it's in the state law. Yes. What I'm saying is that I'd like to strike that limit that there may be more than one in addition. Just like many other people have gotten up, or several others have stated the same. Um, that's that's your, your prerogative. The planning board recommended that we follow what the state minimum is. But if you wish to do that, I, that's yeah. your prerogative. All right, well, that is my prerogative. Here we need to get a motion in f proper form. Sir, could you come down and speak yeah. to town council? Once we get that in form, the chair will accept the motion and ask for a second. In the meantime, while they're working on that, I will take other comments. Uh, Mr. Petropoulos. So firstly, I'd like to thank the many people that worked really hard to try to understand this and boil it down to understandable components so that we could cast an intelligent vote here tonight and uh, at our spring election and then at the fall election if, uh, if it comes to that. Um, the planning board, um, select person Pine, uh, and the many others. Um, unfortunately, this is an imperfect situation and we have a couple of opportunities to do something. This is one of those opportunities and this is the, the proposal that's before us. If we don't vote in favor of this, we will have not passed regulation and marijuana, recreational marijuana will be unregulated in our town until such time as we can pass something. We can pass something in the fall, at the fall town meeting. I'm told by our town council that that then has to be ratified by the attorney general's office. If that, if what we pass in the fall is not ratified um, by December 31st, Starting January 1st of 2019, there will be no regulation on marijuana facilities, recreational marijuana facilities in the town of Groton, and they can go anywhere. So uh, this is an imperfect opportunity for regulation right now, but in my opinion, it's better than the alternative, which would be no regulation at all. We can always relax things, but I don't think we'll be able to tighten things. So I urge you to pass this, not because I'm in favor of marijuana here, not because I'm against mar marijuana here, but because I'm in favor of having some form of regulation here. And if we don't pass this, 
we may very well have none. Thank you. In the back, yes, sir. Uh, Joe Toomey, 38 Mountains Pond Road. Uh, my wife and I uh, raised eight children, all of whom graduated from Groton Dunstable Regional High School. And they each have a certain age. And if you add up all of those ages, we've been parents for 298 years. <laughs> You don't look a year we over all, 150. <laughs> we, also, we also have 13 grandchildren for a total of 81 years, six of whom live in our residents of Groton. I support Article 21. And I also urge you to consider our children and our grandchildren. Recreational marijuana is no friend to any of our children, our grandchildren. Never has been. Support 21, and let's move on to the next juncture. Thank you. The gentleman return to our microphone, please. Uh, sir? Could we just use the microphone down front? I want to get your motion on the floor. So could you just for the uh, record state your name again? My name is Adam Burdett. All right, and your motion is to move to amend uh, section 161C5 by deleting subsection C in its entirety? Yes. Is there a second? Second. A motion to amend has been moved and seconded. That is now on the floor for debate. Did you have anything further to say on that? I'll just read it again that C states, the number of non-retail marijuana establishments shall not exceed one. And I think there may be opportunities for cultivation if they meet all of the other requirements that, that are uh, set up in these regulations. Uh, and more than one reasonable uh, applications come in that we should be able to at least address more than one of them. That's all I'm trying to ask for a uh, majority vote on. Thank you. Okay. And we will return to debate, and I'll start over here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Heather Goddard, Pepperell Road. So. Is my understanding that the state has set forth regulations? So when you say that there aren't any regulations, that's not really true because the state has set forth what seem to be somewhat rigorous regulations as to where these establishments can go. Is that correct? Under the state regulations? Yes. The only regulation the state has affecting where it can go is no marijuana, recreational marijuana establishment can be within 500 feet of a K through 12 school. That's the only regulation they have governing location. Okay. And, that, and that is part of the state law, not the re regulations. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I, I just wanted to clarify. So if we were to pass this zoning and we, in May 22nd, there was an overwhelming want for all sorts of type of marijuana establishments, cultivation, everything, in the same manner that if it, we were totally opposed to it, you can then adjust the zoning to be more laxed to accommodate the voters' true want for May 22nd's eight marijuana questions in the same way as you could make them stern. Um, Am I correct in thinking that? No. I I would like to um, make something clear. The, the referendum that's proposed for May is just a beauty contest. It has no bearing in the opting out process other than it's a means by which it's public sentiment may be, may be discerned. That is, no, I people, know that. People, people may vote. I think so, I didn't ask the so, question. So af after that, if, 
if there was to be a significant vote against marijuana establishments by, by any of these articles, zoning has to be proposed, specific zoning regulation has to be proposed. Um, who proposes it? Mrs. Pine indicated the planning board would be doing it. That's news to us. Um, so the, I, I, the, the specific zoning regulations have to be put in place, have to be proposed. Then it's a two-step process. That then has to go to a general election and it has to receive a majority vote. And before the majority vote, that's to be placed on the ballot and town council no. has to uh, but, uh, do, a, do a summary. And then after that is done, you then have to go to town meeting and secure a two-thirds vote. So I, I understand the process. That wasn't the question I was asking. What I was trying to ask you is, if we go to town meeting on May 22nd and vote on the eight articles, No, which they won't are, be voting on May 22nd uh, at the uh, ballot, at the on election. On the ballot, I'm sorry. Yep. On, on the ballot, and they are only advisory. I 100% understand that. But I'm assuming they're advisory for a per purpose which would be to advise. So if they are to advise, whether it be the planning board or to advise the board of selectmen, I would imagine you would take that advisement and then s establish zoning that would be more associated to that advisement where we only had a 56% passing of marijuana legal in Groton. We are now asking what our town people want for those, for those different categories. So that's what I'm asking. We still have to go through that same process I outlined to either outright Correct. prohibit or further restrict than what we are proposing now. So we could change it to include more than one establishment or strike this later in November should we choose to we, do we, so. We can make it more permissive without going through another referendum. Okay. If you want to make it more restrictive than what we presently are proposing, and we're proposing the bare, uh, the bare minimum that you have to allow under state regulations and state law, but if you want to restrict it even further and say you don't want to have a testing facility or you don't want to have a, a retail store, you have to go through that rigorous opting out process, which is a referendum vote that has to have specific language and then it has to go back to town meeting with the exact same language and receive a two-third vote. But you can do the opposite as well. In other words, you, that's what I'm trying to ask you. You can make them more lax and allow more establishments should you... By a two-thirds vote, but without having to go through a referendum. So this zoning can be changed. That's what I'm trying to ask you. This zoning, this zoning can be changed in November if we so chose to. To make it less restrictive. Yes. The that's zoning the would be changed at a town meeting whenever it was called okay. for that purpose. So it can be changed. It's not permanent. That's my point. No, no zoning, zoning is permanent. No, no, no bylaws. No is permanent. Right. permanent. Yes, sir, in the back. Yes. Mark Presti, Fieldstone Drive. Um, so Alexander Pope had that famous line in his poem about fools rush in. And I would suggest that uh, we're all fairly new to this. And I would suggest that we be. Uh, cautious in opening up the, the aperture a bit too wide. Uh, I think that it is advisable if we have to go down this road to start with one and no more. Uh, that being said, uh, I'd point out that there are towns uh, that have done quite well without having alcohol in their communities. Uh, case in point, uh, Rockport. Uh, they were a community that wanted the had the same objective of stay and play as part of their community growth plan. And uh, we're doing, we just were, we passed regulation to uh, promote uh, the, the development and the fostering of our waterways in that, in, uh, towards that intent. Uh, I think we've got a good plan here and I think we are, we need to st uh, be paced here, measured and a little bit more um, cautious before we open the floodgates. So I am most definitely in favor of one only. And I think that as we just heard here, we can revisit if we at some point 
uh, reconsider this to be a wise uh, step forward. Thank you. In the back, yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question. What is a testing facility? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Some people have asked that, but it's, uh, I'll explain it, and you'll see it's pretty logical. Uh, one of the ways that marijuana will be consumed is through uh, edibles. Mm -hmm. And you know when you make brownies or chocolate chip cookies, sometimes you end up, you have all the chocolate chips in one cookie or all the, the walnuts are in one brownie. What simply the testing facilities are for, uh, for example, edibles, they want to be certain that when edibles are made that there's no concentrations, that it's homogeneous throughout the entire batch. The other reason that they have testing facilities is that the marijuana plant is a notorious vacuum of anything that's in the soil. So if you have contaminated soil, you should plant hemp or marijuana because it, the uptake of all the, the heavy metals and nasties go up with it. But if, uh, so part of the reasoning for the testing facilities is to make sure that the purity of, of the plant is absent any type of impurities that may have been up, uptake through uh, contaminated or uh, marginal soils. Thanks, that answers my question. It makes sense now, doesn't yeah. it? Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess my comment is that if AIR's already got the medical dispensary, it's already working on having a retail dispensary, and I believe that you can get it delivered to your house if you have a medical car legally already, and we're all allowed to have six plants at our houses already. Um, I think the retail ship has kind of sailed on Groton. Um, but I like the idea that we could have a testing facility, that we could have uh, maybe uh, some cultivation here in town, and having just one location of that seems not necessary. Um, and I think that the, the thing that brings most fear into people is retail establishments and going and buying it. But maybe it's a really good use for some farmers, so I'm behind your amendment. Uh, Mr. Delaney, I think I saw next. Uh, Tom Delaney, Chickpea Row. So, for better or worse, it's here. I think having the regulations is going to be a good thing. But to make them so restrictive that it's going to go somewhere else, I'll, I'll remind people about 20 years ago or so, maybe a little bit more, when McDonald's was going to go at the corner of Townsend Road and 119, and we said, well, we're not going to have a drive through So what did they do? They moved 50 yards over into, into uh, Townsend. They got all the tax revenue, and we got all the trash. So you know what? If we're going to have it in town, let's have it in town and get the tax revenue instead of having to go 50 yards over the line. Because it's here anyways. Yes, sir. Mr. Kiosian. Miran Kiosian, Flavel Road. Uh, Mr. Burke, Planning Board members, thank you for taking uh, what I'm sure was an inordinate amount of time navigating through this maze. Um, and since Article 21, already gives you, gives us the opportunity to expand, change, alter the, um, um, uh, the way in which we approach this, which is inevitable. I recommend that we, re uh, I urge people to reject the amendment and please vote for Article 21 and thank you again. Yes, ma'am. Camilla Blackman, Main Street. Um, I want to make a, just a general comment uh, about Somebody asked, had we asked Colorado or other places how it went? And a while ago, quite a long time ago, I visited the Netherlands, I visited Holland, when they had marijuana everywhere. You couldn't walk down the street without smelling it. That was when you, when you uh, smelled it here, you knew if someone was being illegal. So I was back in Holland this year I didn't smell it anywhere. I asked some people that live there, what's happened? Oh, we still have marijuana, but we have many less places that you can buy it. Because, and I said, why? Because we want to make it a little harder for young people to get easily. So that is a comment from a whole nother country, um, which had, as you know, you could go into any bar, any drugstore, any restaurant and get pot a while ago. Ladies and gentlemen, is there further debate? Oh, yes, uh, Ms. Ellen. 
and the wireless. Since there have been 13 voters who've spoken since we last had that question, I don't uh, consider it too early to ask it again. So is there a second to moving the question? Second. Moving the question, uh, we'll move, we would move the uh, amendment, we'd vote uh, straight on the amendment, and then we would vote on the uh, main motion in whatever form it takes, whether you amend it or not. Moving the question suppresses debate, requires a two-thirds majority. All those in favor of moving the question signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. The, <laughs> the motion to move the question passes by a unanimous vote. Ladies and gentlemen, you have first before you a motion to amend. The motion is <clears throat> to amend section 16.1C5 by deleting subsection C in its entirety. If you vote in favor of the amendment, you will be deleting the words, the number of non-retail marijuana establishments shall not exceed one. If you vote against the amendment, that language will stay in there. While the main motion requires a two-thirds vote, the motion to amend requires a simple majority. All those in favor of the motion to amend signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. The chair will ask for a show of cards before we go to tellers. Please get out your green cards. Does everybody have them? Could you bring up the lights, please? The chair doesn't have night vision goggles. Mr. Hamilton's there. Could you bring up the lights? I guess not. We'll try this. Uh, all in favor of the motion to amend, and I will slow down as Mr. Hamilton walks to the booth to turn the lights up. Raise your hand and leave it. Raise your card. Thank you. Those opposed to the motion to amend. Based on visual observation, the chair would declare the no's have it, and the motion to amend does not pass. We now move to the main motion under Article 21. It requires a two-thirds majority. All those in favor of the main motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. Article 21 passes by a two-thirds majority unless there are seven voters who wish to challenge a ruling of the chair. Failing to see seven voters, Article 21 passes by a two-thirds majority. Article 22, Mrs. Manugian. I move that the town vote to accept Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 64N, Section 3, and impose the local sales tax upon the sale of recreational marijuana originating within the town by a vendor at a rate of 3% of the gross receipts of the vendor from the sale of recreational marijuana, marijuana products, and marijuana edibles, said excise to take effect on July 1st, 2018. Article 22 has been moved and seconded. Mrs. Manugian. Uh, so effectively, we have extended the moratorium. We now have some controls in place. We have the right to alter those in the future. Um, now we are asking for the right to tax any recreational sales within our community. Is there any debate or comments or questions under Article 22? Yes, ma'am. Again, I would just ask how this compares to our treatment of alcohol sales. Mrs. Manugan or someone? Or anyone else? Uh, Mark? <laughs> Town Manager, Mr. Haddad. There is no, thank you, Mr. Moderator. There is no provision under state law that allows local communities to tax alcohol. All those taxes are done at the state level. Marijuana does give us 
the ability, state law does give us the ability to tax at the local level, similar to what we can do with meals tax and the occupancy tax. Thank you. In the back, yes, sir. Yeah, Bill Greathead, Squanna Cook Drive. Uh, how did you arrive at the 3%? That's all I was curious. The 3% is the maximum that the state allows us. It is, it okay. Is. All right, thank you. Are there other questions or comments or debate under Article 22? If not, requires a majority vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. Article 22 passes by a majority vote. Article 23, Mr. Geminer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town vote to extend the Groton Center Sewer District as established by the vote of the special town meeting of February 6th 1989 under Article 7 and as shown most recently on the plan approved under Article 14 of the annual town meeting of April 25, 2005 to include the property shown as Assessor's Lot 115-8, 21 Lovers Lane, provided that all costs of designing, laying, and construction of the extension and any associated connection and the cost of additional capacity and the property owner's proportionate share of the general benefit facilities and all other costs associated therewith are paid by the owner of the property benefit thereby, whether by the assessment of betterments or otherwise. Article 23 has been moved and seconded. Mr. Gominer. Um, briefly, the property um, needs a new septic system, um, and this is the least expensive solution for the property owner. Um, is to connect to the sewer. They came and spoke to us. Um, we have the capacity, and the Sewer Commission supports this article. Floor is now open for debate. Are there any questions or comments? Seeing none, the chair will call a vote. Requires a majority vote. All those in favor of Article 23 signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Article 23 passes by a unanimous vote. <clears throat> Article 24, Mr. Petropoulos. Uh, I move that this article be indefinitely postponed. A motion has been made and seconded to indefinitely postpone. Article 24, Mr. Petropoulos. This article would have established the Four Corners Sewer District, but due to uh, some issues with its drafting, it needs to be pulled back and redrafted and brought back forward to the fall town meeting. Are there any questions under Article 24? A motion to indefinitely postpone. If you vote for it, we'll move on to Article 25. If you vote against the motion to indefinitely postpone Article 24, then the chair would entertain a, an affirmative motion on it. Uh, Mr. Cunningham. I just have a question. Does this affect the operation of that sewer district? No. No, it does not. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any further questions under the motion to indefinitely postpone Article 24? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. Article 24 passes by unanimous vote. Article 25, Mr. Petropoulos. I move that the town vote pursuant to Mass General Laws, chapters 262, section 34, to amend chapter 139 of the code of the town of Groton, fees by adding a new section, section 139-1, as set forth in the warrant. Article 25 has been moved and seconded, Mr. Petropoulos. So as it turns out, um, the Board of Selectmen has been setting fees for quite some time, but in fact, the town meeting was provided with the authority to do that. Uh, this would allow the, allow the town, uh, the Board of Selectmen to do that fee setting in the future. Are there questions or comments under Article 25? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Chair will hear it again. All those in favor of Article 25 signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. Article 25 passes by a majority vote. Article 26, Mr. Morrison. I move that the town authorize vote to authorize the town manager on behalf of the Conservation Commission 
to enter into a license agreement with an individual or individuals to conduct agricultural activities at Serendon Farms West for a term not to exceed 10 years. Article 26 has been moved and seconded. Mr. Morrison. The Conservation Commission wants to have our agricultural land in productive agriculture. Uh, Serendon Farms West has invasives and is partially overgrown. Uh, if I could have the first picture up there. There it is. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, general field, which is right next to Serendon Farms West before it was rehabilitated. Uh, the Conservation Commission is limited to a maximum of a three-year lease, and then the lease comes up for bids again to anybody who wants to uh, work the land. Uh, it may take three to five years of work to restore this land to a productive status. If I could have the next picture. This is a picture of the general field during reconstruction or reclamation. No farmer really wants to take on the responsibility for rehabil rehabilitation if there's no guarantee that he will still have the lease five years later when the land again becomes productive. This article asks the town meeting to authorize the town manager to enter into a license agreement on behalf of the Conservation Commission for a period of up to 10 years. Um, last picture. This is a picture of the general field after rehabilitation, and this is what we want the uh, Serendon Farms West to look like. This 10-year lease will allow a farmer to, ent to invest in the land and be able to harvest his crop without fear that after his investment, somebody else will reap the prop profit of his rewards. And I really hope you all support this article. Floor is now open for debate on Article 26. <clears throat> Comments or questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Chuck Vanderland in Pleasant Street. I've been a member of the Groton Conservation Trust for a long time. Uh, we uh, strongly support this article. One of the reasons, well, the trust acquired what was what Peters referred to as a general field in the same transaction that led to the town acquiring uh, what's now referred to as general field west or Serendid Farm West. Um, We've been successful because we had the ability to enter into a long-term lease with a farmer that could be responsible about the land, and we feel like the town ought to have the same ability. Questions, comments, under Article 26? Yes, sir. Do you have a prospective tenant? Mr. Morrison. Yeah, we've put that out to uh, bids a few times. We have a uh, prospective tenant, and uh, he's ready to uh, move forward on this after this town meeting vote, should it be in the affirmative. Other questions or comments under Article 26? Seeing none, the chair will call the vote. Requires a majority. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Article 26 passes by a unanimous vote. Article 27, Mr. Petropoulos. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I move that the town vote to accept as a donation from the owner a parcel of land located off Lowell Road, shown as parcel number 234-2-0 on the Groton Assessor's Maps and containing approximately 1,742 square feet, said parcel be, to be placed under the custody and control of the Conservation Commission and to authorize the Board of Selectmen and the Conservation Commission to take all actions and execute all documents necessary or convenient in connection with the acquisition of said land. Article 27 has been moved and seconded, Mr. Petropoulos. This is a small parcel of land. It's assessed at around $5,000. Uh, that nets $100 a year in tax revenue. Um, so there will be very little hit to revenues for this. And um, I urge us to vote in favor of this. There are questions under Article 27? Yes, sir, Mr. Morrison. On February 27th, the Conservation Commission obviously voted unanimously to accept this gift. Any other comments or questions under Article 27? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Article 27 passes by unanimous vote. Article 28, Mr. Petropoulos. I move that the town vote to accept as a donation from the owner a parcel of land located off Throne Hill Road, shown as parcel number 205-41-0 on the Groton Assessor's maps and containing approximately 
0.62 acres, said parcel to be placed under the custody and control of the Conservation Commission, and to authorize the Board of Selectmen and the Conservation Commission to take all actions and execute all documents necessary or convenient in connection with the acquisition of said land. Article 28 has been moved and seconded, Mr. Petropoulos. Similar to the last article, this uh, piece of land is assessed at $15,800 and contributes a little bit under $300 a year to uh, our revenues. For the Conservation Commission, Mr. Morrison. And at the same meeting on February 27th, the Conservation Commission voted unanimously to accept this donation. Thank you. Are there any questions under Article 28? Requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, Article 28 passes by unanimous vote. Article 29, Mr. Robert Collins. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town vote to zone the property situated at 186 Main Street, which is shown on the Groton Assessor's maps as parcel 113-1 and is described in a deed recorded with the Middlesex County South District Registry of Deeds in book 70228 at page 254 as RB residential business. Article 29 has been moved and seconded. Mr. Collins. This article involves the uh, property situated at 186 Main Street which is the large white house situated diagonally across from the town hall at the corner of Hollis Street and Main Street. The house on this property is a very nice old imposing house. It's about 150 years old and has unfortunately fallen into decline over the last 20 years or so. My client, who is Donna Ward, maintains an intellectual property uh, legal practice at 142 Main Street, which is up by the uh, natural market. She purchased this property last year and proposes to locate her office here and to restore this home utilizing the very high standards that she and her husband used at her current office. Interestingly, using this property as a, partially as an office, is consistent with its historical use. The uh, original builder of the present house was a Mr. Hollingsworth, who was involved with the uh, H&V mill in West Groton. And after World War II, Dr. Richard Lavinia had his medical practice here. Now what the proposal is, is to restore this house to its appearance roughly about 100 years ago, and I think the architect's renderings of, of this are on the screen behind me, and it would maintain a residential appearance from the front and side facades. The principal change to the building itself will be the addition of a door, which will serve as the door to Donna's office on the uh, back of the building itself. Um, we've, over the last seven months, I have consulted with the planning board and the Historic District Commission, and both boards have uh, very favorably received the proposal to restore this house. If um, this article is approved, I have to go back to the planning board for site plan review approval, and I'll have to file with the Zoning Board of Appeals for a special permit, because our zoning requires a professional office in the IB uh, district to be subject to a special permit. One of the uh, finest attributes, I think, that we have as a town is the lovely character that this town has. And one of the principal components of that character is our very attractive town center. One of the challenges we're going to face as a community as time goes on is maintaining the viability of some of the notable structures uh, that are situated throughout the town, but particularly in the center. Approval of this article will allow for the restoration of this house to its appearance about 100 years ago and to the uh, fine character it's enjoyed uh, in its life. That will also um, re allow repurposing it 
which will uh, ensure its continued viability, I think, for decades to come. So I ask for your support on this article. With a report of the Planning Board, Mr. Geiger. At a regular meeting on April 12th, 2018, the Planning Board voted unanimously to recommend approval of the citizens' petition to rezone the property at 186 Main Street to residential business. Thank you, sir. Are there any comments, questions, or debate on Article 29? Because it is a change in zoning, it will require a two-thirds majority. Seeing no questions, the chair will call for the vote. All those in favor of the main motion under Article 29 signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. Article 29 passes by a unanimous vote. Thank you. Article 30, Mr. Gordon. I'd like to motion that we postpone this article indefinitely. We have a motion to indefinitely postpone Article 30, Mr. Gordon. Uh, the reason for the, the uh, postponement is that this is all having to do with the church, is that we are, well, the, the builder, developer is taking a different track, and our next move is to go before the Zoning Board of Appeals. Okay. So, therefore, town meeting approval isn't really necessary. Are there questions or comments under the motion to indefinitely postpone Article 30? It will only require a majority vote. Seeing none, the chair will call the vote. All those in favor of indefinitely postponing Article 30 signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Article 30 is indefinitely postponed by unanimous vote. Thank you. Article 31, Mr. Callahan. Mr. Moderator, I move that the town vote to adopt the resolution supporting state and federal legislation to provide greater transparency in political donations and limit the influence of money in politics as set forth in the warrant. Article 31 has been moved and seconded. Mr. Callahan. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for listening to this proposal. Um, my name is Tom Callahan. I live on Townsend Road in West Groton. Uh, next month, I'll be wrapping up my 38-year career teaching United States history and government, um, pushing myself over my comfort le level a little tonight to have, have you join me in taking, these, taking a stand against the corrupting influence of money in politics. These words above me, <laughs> I hope you recognize, convey to you, I think, my motivation in bringing this article before you. I suppose you know them. As part from this, these are the words of Thomas Jefferson from the Declaration of Independence. I gotta say that through the years of teaching US history, uh, my bromance with the Jefferson has been a rocky one, but I have to say, this idea evinces to me an awesome truth, and I hope it does for you too. And I put it to you, now is the time for us to fundamentally alter our form of government. Here, take a look at slide two. This shows, <clears throat> excuse me, this shows um, just confidence in, in Congress. It, it, it's gotten down to 7% by this measure. 7% um, confidence says it all. Politics is not working for us in the United States. The fact is politics is how we practice democracy. Don't, no politics, no democracy. Broken politics, broken democracy. Here's slide, slide three, here's another. Another development, which I'm sure you're familiar, uh, Citizens United. Citizens United versus the Federal Elections Commission in 2010 uh, gave rise to super PACs with their unlimited and unregulated political donations that, among other things, opened the door to foreign influence in our political system. I could tell you tons more about what a corrupting influence, the idea that giving a million bucks to a candidate is the same as giving them 50 bucks has had on our political system, but I really don't think I need to tell you that's necessary. It's time to unrig the system. Slide four. The American Anti-Corruption Act is a model policy that sets a framework for city, state, and federal laws. It fundamentally alters the rules of American politics and restores sovereignty to where it belongs, with the people, not with the money. Slide five. The act, act aims to stop political bribery, so special interests can't use job offers and donations to influence politicians. 
It will end secret money, so people who know who's buying the influence. It will give every voter a voice so that our elections can convey the will of the people. Last year, 25 town meetings in, in Massachusetts passed resolutions similar to the one before us tonight. <laughs> I stole that from him, <laughs> among, among them were the Middlesex towns of Acton, Concord, Lexington, and Stoneham. The American Anti-Corruption Act was drafted by some of the nation's foremost constitutional attorneys. It is constitutional. It is absolutely nonpartisan. Now let me describe to you a few of the provisions. Um, there is a handout available, still I think in the back, I got more, um, to explain these provisions. Uh, but you can also go online to anticorruption.org and get more details or, or read the act itself. Slide six. Here's one. Close the lobbyist Congress revolving door. You, perhaps you know about this. Slide seven. On average, when a member of Congress leaves public office to become a lobbyist, they get a 1,452% uh, raise. Uh, on average, the American people think that's crazy. I don't know. Here's another reform provided by the Act. Slide eight, open primaries in every state. In 2010, California passed Proposition 14, whereby every primary voter in this has the same ballot in state and federal races, not in the presidential. This graph shows approval ratings number nine for the CA, California State Legislature, as compared to Congress. They like it. Can you imagine the improvement this would make in Massachusetts. I haven't time to go into the details of the troubles we have with political corruption in our state. You read the news, it's a mess. We actually have elections in this state where it's not uncommon for there to be no choice presented at all to the voters. There are representative districts in this state where election after election, the incumbent faces no significant opposition or no opposition at all. When incumbent state representatives run for re-election in Massachusetts, they win 96% of the time. State senators do better. They win 99% of the time. What kind of politics is this? This is not politics. This is not democracy. It breeds corruption. Let's change the rules. Another one, slide 10. Uh, gerrymandering was invented in Massachusetts. I expect you're familiar with this practice that we have allowed to develop where the representatives end up choosing their voters rather than the voters choosing the representatives. Uh, California, too, and other states. Iowa has always had a different system. But California, too, has taken the lead um, in, reform, in, in reference to this, this reform. Uh, California districts are now set by a commission that was designed particularly for that purpose. It's not set by the state legislatures. Why not Massachusetts? OK, slide 11. Um, this is ranked choice voting. This is also known as instant runoff voting. There's no quick way for me to explain this, but it's a very cool idea. Uh, you should check it out. It's happening in Maine, and as we all know, as Maine goes, so goes the nation. Oops. Among the benefits of this reform, <laughs> you remember, <laughs> some of us remember that. Uh, among the benefits this reform offers is the end of, our, of, of us finding ourselves in the voting booth with our thumbs uh, firmly pressed on our nose. Here's a good piece of news, number 12, um, which is that automatic voter registration has come to Massachusetts, or is about to. Uh, it hasn't passed yet. It's before the legislature. Keep your fingers crossed or do something about it. Um, that's a good one. There are other provisions of the ACA. Uh, you can read them on the next one. Uh, prohibits politicians from taking campaign money from the interests they regulate. Limits unregulated super PACs shady contributions and coordinations with the campaigns. It prevents lobbyists from giving massive donations to candidates, parties, and other PACs. Uh, presently, we have, last one, we have four of the five representatives to which we are entitled working for us in Boston and Washington. You know who they are, their, their names appear on the article, and it is to them uh, and their successors that this resolution is directed. I urge you to vote yes on this resolution instruct our representatives to take action to protect our democracy from the corrupting influence of money. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Article 31 is a citizen's petition. It is non-binding, but the vote on it would reflect the will or the opinion of this meeting. The floor is now open to debate. Any questions or comments? Yes, sir. 
Uh, Richard Hewitt, uh, Longley Road. Uh, I move that Article 31 be postponed indefinitely. A motion has been made to indefinitely postpone Article 31. Is there a second? It has been moved and seconded to indefinitely postpone Article 31. A motion to indefinitely postpone does not suppress debate. The floor remains open for debate. Mr. Hewitt. Yeah, I don't really have an objection to much of what Tom said. In fact, I support a lot of it. I just think we need to make a decision as a town as to how we want town meeting to be handled. Uh, it seems to me this is an issue that's better put on the ballot where more people can vote. Um, it has nothing to do with Groton. There is no, uh, you know, donations from uh, corporations or unions as far as I know to any of those selectmen. It's not a local issue. It's fine to put it on the ballot, but we really shouldn't be going down this road. We went down this road with national politics last town meeting, and regardless of what side you were on things, I think everybody can agree it was pretty ugly and divisive, and I think it's a mistake. Mr. Callahan, did you want to respond? What can I say? Um, Richard, um, this is town meeting. We, we, we have a country to save, how I feel. And what we do here and what we've been doing in this town meeting, continue to do, we are in the perfect place to be the ones to, to, to speak about this and to instruct our representatives. I also have to say, you know, it's been part of Ameri our tradition in this town that, in fact, town meeting was a time when instructions to our representatives were made. You can read, you can do the history and look at it. So I, this, is, this is what town meeting is about. We've always instructed our representatives to do things. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm Mr. not Hewitt. opposed to our instructing to our, uh, officials how to uh, vote in uh, Boston, but the point is that it's much more democratic if you have it at the ballot box where 10 times as many people vote. You know, if we're trying to get more participatory democracy, which I do support and I do agree with Tom on, then I think that's a better forum for it. I'm not opposed to this kind of question being raised. I just opposed to bringing it up at town meeting as opposed to putting it on the town uh, ballot. Yes, sir, in the back. So, uh, Mr. Callahan, I, I applaud you for, for bringing this forward. Uh, I think it's, there's not one thing that I disagree with here. Uh, I, I see this less about politics and more about the integrity of our society. Uh, I guess uh, I think I understand the other gentleman's point over here. I think it's a fine point. My question is, what is the experience in the other towns? Have they brought it before town meeting or have they put it up for a vote? Uh, I don't see this as a bad forum for this but it would be good to have some guidance about the experience of other communities. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Callahan. 25 towns in Massachusetts passed a resolution like this that was sponsored by the um, Anti-Corruption Act or in opposition to, the, in, in favor of the Anti-Corruption Act. Um, I don't think any turned it down. There are, the other towns are looking at it this year. That's all I know. If I can just uh, follow up, I, my yeah, question is, yeah. was it on, on ballot or was it a town meeting? Town meeting, town meeting. Okay. We've so had ballot before in this town too. You guys remember in, in 2014, we had one on the constitutional amendment, 28th amendment. So that's a legitimate way to make our, 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 our motion known. And I may, I may say that our representative um, didn't listen to that recommendation when our town voted 73% to support a 28th amendment. I, I'm, this is democracy. I don't know what you, how you make these rules. Fair enough. So let me just a ask here. So uh, the, I need to read up on this, and I will do so. Sure. But uh, the intent seems at federal level, but would be applicable also at a state level. Right. But there is no intent or application to a local level. Is that correct? Well, um, the the law itself, cities, the city of Tallahassee, has adopted much of, of this, for example. So it could be local as well. And so, gathering uh, all of this 
uh, voting up at the grassroots local level mm -hmm. will do what for the idea is organizations the the such as such as um, 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 it's gone up there, but it's uh, represent us, represent dot us would be able to. So this is just simply that the town giving a yeah, recommendation. Yeah, and then we can speak to representatives and say, or speak to, to candidates. Right, we have an election you. campaign, and we might, at this time, it would be great if people could speak up and said, are you guys in support of reform of the kind that will give us our democracy back and take the interests away? From, from you know, that's, that, this is it. It's politics, I know, but this is, you, we can't do democracy without politics, guys. Thanks so much, appreciate it, well done. Mr. Funch. Hey, one more thing tonight. Um, yeah, I think this is really important, and I think that the uh, people who are left here are the participants in our local democracy. Um, you, you know, you're here for the uninteresting articles and <laughs> the thing that everybody else has left uh, to go home to sleep or whatever. Uh, and the reason we have town meeting and not ballots is so that ideas get discussed. It doesn't happen a lot, but actually, it does happen fairly often in this town. We have good discussions about uh, important things. And, and I think it, you know, this is a nonpartisan issue, although I'm not even sure if it was partisan, it would be outside the bounds of town meeting to, to take a vote. But this is certainly uh, nonpartisan, and we should express our opinion. And uh, we should send it to people who might listen to our opinion. And so I, I, I think it's exactly the kind of thing that we should do at town meeting, and I encourage you to participate. And Ms. Petropoulos. I, I have to support Mr. Funch's opinion, and that's why I stood up, was uh, I think this is exactly the place. We cannot have a discussion at the ballot. We can have individual discussions over kitchen tables, but we can't have a discussion as a community the way we can here. Uh, we're going to come to town meeting perhaps in the fall, and uh, depending on how our ballot, how the, the election goes, um, with regard to the marijuana question that we'll vote on later on this month. And at the fall, at the fall town meeting, we'll vote on that question again. And if we decide to ban marijuana, we'll again have to go to the ballot for it. It's a wonderful place to take questions that will have subsequent referendum. But this is the place where we actually get to have discussion. And so I've, I urge us to allow this uh, vote to happen here today. In the back, yes, Ms. Allen. Is there a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded to move the, mo the question. Which one? I'll get there. Hang on. A motion to move the question suppresses debate and requires a two-thirds majority. If you vote in favor of the motion to move the question, we will then vote on the motion on whether to indefinitely postpone Article 31. If that motion to indefinitely postpone passes, we will move on to Article 32. The motion to indefinitely postpone fails. We will then vote on the main motion under Article 31. Is that clear? On the motion to move the question, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The motion to move the question passes by a majority vote. We now go to the motion to, in, or by a two thirds majority. We now go to the motion on whether to indefinitely postpone the main motion under Article 31. This requires a simple majority. If you vote to indefinitely postpone, we will move on to Article 32. If you vote against indefinite postponement, we will then vote on the main motion under Article 31. All those in favor of indefinitely postponing Article 31 signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The motion to indefinitely postpone fails to achieve a majority. We now move to Article 31, the main motion, which is to move that the town vote to adopt the resolution supporting state and federal legislation to provide greater transparency in political donations and limit the influence of money in politics as set forth in the warrants. This requires a majority vote. All in favor of the main motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. The ayes have it. Article 31 passes. Article 32 through 34 is the consent agenda. Mrs. Manugian. Thank you. I move that the town vote to combine for consideration Articles 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, and 42 of the warrant for this town meeting 
and that the town take affirmative action on said articles as set forth in the motions in the town meeting information handout without debate and in accordance with the action proposed under each motion. Provided, however, that if any voter prior to the taking of the vote requests the right to debate a specific article, then said article shall be removed from this motion and acted upon in the ordinary course of business. Ladies and gentlemen, I will read the article numbers. If you wish to hold one of the articles and pull it out for separate debate and vote, say hold and raise your hand. <clears throat> article 32. Article 33. Article 34. Article 35. Article 36. Article 37. Article 38. Article 39. Article 40. Article 41. Article 42. Is the chair correct in that there is no voter that wishes to hold any of these articles? If that's the case, we will move directly to a vote on the consent agenda for articles 32 through 34. All those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. The consent agenda passes by a unanimous vote. The chair will now accept a motion to dissolve this annual town meeting. It has been moved and seconded to dissolve this meeting. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. This spring town meeting is dissolved.